A lack of rupees for a bit of advice in Myths and Legends Around the World, Collection 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ahana Malik. A lack of rupees for a bit of advice by Joseph Jacobs. A poor blind Brahmin and his wife were dependent on their son for their subsistence. Every day the young fellow used to go out and get what he could by begging. This continued for some time till at last he became quite tired of such a wretched life and determined to go and try his luck in another country. He informed his wife of his intention and ordered her to manage somehow or other for the old people during the few months that he would be absent. He begged her to be industrious, lest his parents should be angry and curse him. One morning, he started with some food in a bundle and walked on day after day, till he reached the chief city of the neighbouring country. Here he went and sat down by a merchant's shop and asked alms. The merchant inquired whence he had come, why he had come, and what was his caste, to which he replied that he was a Brahman, and was wandering hither and thither, begging a livelihood for himself, and wife and parents. Moved with pity for the man, the merchant advised him to visit the kind and generous king of that country and offered to accompany him to the court. Now at that time it happened that the king was seeking for a Brahman to look after a golden temple which he had just built. His majesty was very glad. Therefore, when he saw the Brahmin and heard that he was good and honest, he at once deputed him to the charge of his temple and ordered 50 carvers of rice and 100 rupees to be paid to him every year as wages. Two months after this, the Brahmin's wife, not having heard any news of her husband, left the house and went in quest of him. By a happy fate, she arrived at the very place that he had reached, where she heard that every morning at the golden temple, a golden rupee was given in the king's name to any beggar who chose to go for it. Accordingly, on the following morning, she went to the place and met her husband. Why have you come here? he asked. Why have you left my parents? Care you not whether they curse me and I die? Go back immediately and await my return. No, no, said the woman. I cannot go back to starve and see your old father and mother die. There is not a grain of rice left in the house. O oh, Bhagavan, exclaimed the Brahmin. Here, take this, he continued scribbling a few lines on some paper and then handing it to her and give it to the king. You will see that he will give you a lakh of rupees for it. Thus saying, he dismissed her and the woman left. On this scrap of paper were written three pieces of advice. First, if a person is traveling and reaches any strange place at night, let him be careful where he puts up and not close his eyes in sleep lest he close them in death. Secondly, if a man has a married sister and visits her in great pomp, she will receive him for the sake of what she can obtain from him. But if he comes to her in poverty, she will frown on him and disown him. Thirdly, if a man has to do any work, he must do it himself and do it with might and without fear. 
On reaching her home, the Brahmani told her parents of her meeting with her husband and what a valuable piece of paper he had given her. But not liking to go before the king herself, she sent one of her relations. The king read the paper and ordering the man to be flogged, dismissed him. The next morning, the Brahmani took the paper and while she was going along the road to the Darbar reading it, the king's son met her and asked what she was reading. Whereupon, she replied that she held in her hands a paper containing certain bits of advice for which she wanted a lakh of rupees. The prince asked her to show it to him and when he had read it, gave her a parvana for the amount and rode on. The poor Brahmani was very thankful. That day, she laid in a great store of provisions, sufficient to last them all for a long time. In the evening, the prince related to his father the meeting with the woman and the purchase of the piece of paper. He thought his father would applaud the act, but it was not so. The king was more angry than before and banished his son from the country. So the prince bade adieu to his mother and his relations and friends and rode off on his horse, whither he did not know. At nightfall, he arrived at some place where a man met him and invited him to lodge at his house. The prince accepted the invitation and was treated like a prince. Matting was spread for him to squat on and the best provisions set before him. Ah, thought he as he laid down to rest, here is a case for the first piece of advice that the Brahmani gave me. I will not sleep tonight. It was well that he thus resolved, for in the middle of the night, the man rose up and taking a sword in his hand, rushed to the prince with the intention of killing him. But he rose up and spoke. Do not slay me, he said. What profit would you get from my death? If you killed me, you would be sorry afterwards, like that man who killed his dog. What man? What dog? he asked. I will tell you, said the prince, if you will give me that sword. So he gave him the sword and the prince began his story. Once upon a time, there lived a wealthy merchant who had a pet dog. He was suddenly reduced to poverty and had to part with his dog. He got a loan of 5,000 rupees from a brother merchant, leaving the dog as a pledge and with the money began business again. Not long after this, the other merchant's shop was broken into by thieves and completely sacked. There was hardly 10 rupees worth left in the place. The faithful dog, however, knew what was going on and went and followed the thieves and saw where they deposited the things and then returned. In the morning, there was great weeping and lamentation in the merchant's house when it was known what had happened. The merchant himself nearly went mad. Meanwhile, the dog kept on running to the door and pulling at his merchant's shirt and pajamas as though wishing him to go outside. At last, a friend suggested that perhaps the dog knew something of the whereabouts of the things and advised the merchant to follow its leadings. The merchant consented and went after the dog right up to the very place where the thieves had hidden the goods. Here the animal scraped and barked and showed in various ways that the things were underneath. So the merchant and his friends dug about the place and soon came upon all the stolen property. Nothing was missing. There was everything just as the thieves had taken them. The merchant was very glad. On returning to his house, he at once sent the dog back to its old master with a letter rolled under the collar, 
wherein he had written about the sagacity of the beast and begged his friend to forget the loan and to accept another 5,000 rupees as a present. When this merchant saw his dog coming back again, he thought, Alas, my friend is wanting the money. How can I pay him? I have not had sufficient time to recover myself from my recent losses. I will slay the dog here he reaches the threshold and say that another must have slain him. Thus there will be an end of my debt. No dog, no loan. Accordingly, he ran out and killed the poor dog when the letter fell out of its collar. The merchant picked it up and read it. How great was his grief and disappointment when he knew the facts of the case. Beware, continued the prince, lest you do that which afterwards you would give your life not to have done. By the time the prince had concluded the story, it was nearly morning and he went away after rewarding the man. The prince then visited the country belonging to his brother-in-law. He disguised himself as a jogi and sitting down by a tree near the palace, pretended to be absorbed in worship. News of the man and his wonderful piety reached the ears of the king. He felt interested in him as his wife was very ill and he had sought for Hakim's to cure her but in vain. He thought that perhaps this holy man could do something for her. So he sent to him. But the jogi refused to tread the halls of a king, saying that his dwelling was the open air and that if his majesty wished to see him, he must come himself and bring his wife to the place. Then the king took his wife and brought her to the jogi. The holy man bade her prostrate herself before him, and when she had remained in this position for about three hours, he told her to rise and go, for she was cured. In the evening, there was great consternation in the palace, because the queen had lost her pearl rosary and nobody knew anything about it. At length, someone went to the jogi and found it on the ground by the place where the queen had prostrated herself. When the king heard this, he was very angry and ordered the jogi to be executed. The stern order, however, was not carried out as the prince bribed the men and escaped from the country but he knew that the second bit of advice was true. Clad in his own clothes, the prince was walking along one day when he saw a potter crying and laughing alternatively with his wife and children. Oh fool, said he, what's the matter? If you laugh, why do you weep? If you weep, why do you laugh? Do not bother me, said the potter. What does it matter to you? Pardon me, said the prince, but I should like to know the reason. The reason is this then, said the potter. The king of this country has a daughter whom he is obliged to marry every day because all her husbands die the first night of their stay with her. Nearly all the young men of the place have thus perished and our son will be called on soon. We laugh at the absurdity of the thing, a potter's son marrying a princess, and we cry at the terrible consequence of the marriage. What can we do? Truly a matter for laughing and weeping. But weep no more, said the prince. I will exchange places with your son and will be married to the princess instead of him. Only give me suitable garments and prepare me for the occasion. So the potter gave him beautiful raiment and ornaments and the prince went to the palace. At night, he was conducted to the apartment of the princess. Dread are, thought he, am I to die like the scores of young men before me? He clenched his sword with firm grip and lay down on his bed, intending to keep awake all the night and see what would happen. 
In the middle of the night, he saw two shamars come out from the nostrils of the princess. They stole over towards him, intending to kill him, like the others who had been before him. But he was ready for them. He laid hold of his sword, and when the snakes reached his bed, he struck at them and killed them. In the morning, the king came as usual to inquire, and was surprised to see that his daughter and prince talking gaily together. Surely, said he, this man must be her husband, as he only can live with her. Where do you come from? Who are you? asked the king, entering the room. O king, replied the prince, I am the son of a king who rules over such and such country. When he heard this, the king was very glad and bade the prince to abide in his palace and appointed him his successor to the throne. The prince remained at the palace for more than a year and then asked permission to visit his own country, which was granted. The king gave him elephants, horses, jewels, an abundance of money for the expenses of the way and his presents for his father, and the prince started. On the way, he had to pass through the country belonging to his brother-in-law, whom we have already mentioned. Report of his arrival reached the ears of the king, who came with rope-tied hands and haltered neck to do him homage. He most humbly begged him to stay at his palace and to accept what little hospitality could be provided. While the prince was staying at the palace, he saw his sister, who greeted him with smiles and kisses. On leaving, he told her how she and her husband had treated him at his first visit and how he had escaped and then gave them two elephants, two beautiful horses, 15 soldiers and 10 lakh rupees worth of jewels. Afterwards, he went to his own home and informed his mother and father of his arrival. Alas, his parents had both become blind from weeping about the loss of their son. Let him come in, said the king, and put his hands upon our eyes and we shall see again. So the prince entered and was most affectionately greeted by his old parents and he laid his hands on their eyes and they saw again. Then the prince told his father all that had happened to him and how he had been saved several times by attending to the advice that he had purchased from the Brahmani. Whereupon the king expressed his sorrow for having sent him away and all was joy and peace again. End of A Lack of Rupees for a Bit of Advice in Myths and Legends Around the World, Collection 13. Tricks of the Fox in Myths and Legends Around the World, Collection 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. One day Fox said to his children, I'm going to get some eggs. He went to the woods and saw Eagle's nest high up in a tree. He put some grass stalks into his ears, knocked them on the tree, and said to Eagle, Throw me down an egg. And if you don't, I will knock the tree over with these stalks and break it. Eagle became frightened and threw down an egg. Throw down another, said Fox. That's enough, said Eagle. I will not throw down any more. Fox said, throw it down. If I knock down the tree, I'll take them all. Eagle was frightened and threw down another egg. Then Fox laughed and said, I fooled you nicely. How could I have knocked down a whole tree with these small grass stalks? Eagle became angry. He threw himself upon Fox grasped him with his talons and lifted him high in the air and flew far out to sea and threw him down upon a lonely island. Fox remained on that island. He lived there and thought to himself, am I really going to die on this island? 
Fox began to sing shaman songs. Seals, walrus, and whales appeared near the island. What are you singing about? they asked Fox. This is what I was singing about, said Fox. Are there more animals in the waters of the sea or on the dry land? Certainly there are more in the waters of the sea, so the sea people replied. Well, let us see, said Fox. Come up to the surface of the water and form a raft from this island to the land. Then I will take a walk over you and count you all. The sea people all came up to the surface of the water and formed a raft. Fox ran over their backs, pretending to count them. But as soon as he reached land, he jumped ashore and went home. That's all. End of Tricks of the Fox in Myths and Legends Around the World, Collection 13. Read by Stephanie Wilson, Toronto, November 20th, 2021. Foxfire in Myths and Legends Around the World, Collection 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Once upon a time, there was a strong young farmer who came home late one evening from market. His way led him past the gardens of a wealthy gentleman, in which stood a number of tall buildings. Suddenly, he saw something shining floating in the air inside the gardens, something which glowed like a ball of crystal. He was astonished and climbed the wall around the gardens, but there was not a human being in sight. All he saw was, at a distance, something that appeared to be a dog looking up at the moon. And whenever it blew its breath out, a ball of fire came out of its mouth and rose to the moon. And whenever it drew its breath in, the ball sank down again, and it caught it in its jaws. And so it went on without a stop. Then the farmer realized that it was a fox who was preparing the elixir of life. He hid in the grass and waited until the ball of fire came down again, about the height of his own head. Then he stepped hastily from his hiding place, took it away, and at once swallowed it. And he could feel it glow as it passed down his throat into his stomach. When the fox saw what had happened, he grew angry. He looked furiously at the farmer, but feared his strength. For this reason, he did not dare attack him, but went angrily on his way. From that time on, the farmer boy could make himself invisible, was able to see ghosts and devils, and had intercourse with the spirit world. In cases of sickness, when people lay unconscious, he could call back their souls, and if someone had committed a sin, he could plead for them. He earned much money owing to these gifts. When he reached his fiftieth year, he withdrew from all things and would no longer exercise his arts. One summer evening, he was sitting in his courtyard, enjoying the cool air. While there, he drank a number of goblets of wine, and by midnight had fallen fast asleep. Suddenly he awoke, feeling ill. It seemed as though someone were patting him on the back, and before he knew it, the ball of fire had leaped out from his throat. At once a hand reached for it, and a voice said, For thirty long years you kept my treasure from me, and from a poor farmer lad you have grown to be a wealthy man. Now you have enough, and I would like to have my fireball back again. Then the man knew what had happened. But the fox was gone. End of Foxfire in Myths and Legends Around the World, Collection 13. Read by Stephanie Wilson, Toronto, November 12, 2021. The Story of Princess Hase, a story of old Japan, in Myths and Legends Around the World, Collection 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ahana Malik. The Story of Princess Hase, A Story of Old Japan by Ye Theodora Ozaki. Many, many years ago, there lived in Nara the ancient capital of Japan, 
a wise state minister by name Prince Toyonari Fujiwara. His wife was a noble, good and beautiful woman called Princess Murasaki Violet. They had been married by their respective families according to Japanese custom when very young and had lived together happily ever since. They had, however, one cause for great sorrow, for as the years went by, no child was born to them. This made them very unhappy, for they both longed to see a child of their own who would grow up to gladden their old age, carry on the family name, and keep up the ancestral rites when they were dead. The prince and his lovely wife, after long consultation and much thought, determined to make a pilgrimage to the temple of Hase no Kwanon, goddess of mercy at Hase. For they believed, according to the beautiful tradition of their religion, that the mother of mercy, Kwanon, comes to answer the prayers of mortals in the form that they need the most. Surely after all these years of prayer, she would come to them in the form of a beloved child in answer to their special pilgrimage. For that was the greatest need of their two lives. Everything else they had that this life could give them, but it was all as nothing because the cry of their hearts was unsatisfied. So the Prince Toyonari and his wife went to the temple of Kwanon at Hase and stayed there for a long time, both daily offering incense and praying to Kwanon, the Heavenly Mother, to grant them the desire of their whole lives. And their prayer was answered. A daughter was born at last to the Princess Murasaki, and great was the joy of her heart. On presenting the child to her husband, they both decided to call her Hase Hime, or the Princess of Hase, because she was the gift of the Kwanon at that place. They both reared her with great care and tenderness, and the child grew in strength and beauty. When the little girl was five years old, her mother fell dangerously ill, and all the doctors and their medicines could not save her. A little before she breathed her last, she called her daughter to her, and gently stroking her head, said, Hase Hime, do you know that your mother cannot live any longer? Though I die, you must grow up a good girl. Do your best not to give trouble to your nurse or any other of your family. Perhaps your father will marry again and someone will fill my place as your mother. If so, do not grieve for me, but look upon your father's second wife as your true mother and be obedient and filial to both her and your father. Remember when you are grown up to be submissive to those who are your superiors and to be kind to all those who are under you. Don't forget this. I die with the hope that you will grow up a model woman. Hase Hime listened in an attitude of respect while her mother spoke and promised to do all that she was told. There is a proverb which says, As the soul is at three, so it is at one hundred. And so Hase Hime grew up as her mother had wished, a good an obedient little princess, though she was now too young to understand how great was the loss of her mother. Not long after the death of his first wife, Prince Toyonari married again, a lady of noble birth named Princess Terute. Very different in character, alas, to the good and wise Princess Murasaki, this woman had a cruel, bad heart, she did not love her stepdaughter at all and was often very unkind to the little motherless girl, saying to herself, this is not my child, this is not my child. 
but Hase Hime bore every unkindness with patience and even waited upon her stepmother kindly and obeyed her in every way and never gave any trouble, just as she had been trained by her own good mother so that the Lady Terute had no cause for complaint against her. The little princess was very diligent and her favourite studies were music and poetry. She would spend several hours practising every day and her father had the most proficient of masters he could find to teach her the koto, Japanese harp, the art of writing letters and verse. When she was 12 years of age, she could play so beautifully that she and her stepmother were summoned to the palace to perform before the emperor. It was the festival of the cherry flowers and there were great festivities at the court. The emperor threw himself into the enjoyment of the season and commanded that Princess Hase should perform before him on the koto and that her mother, Princess Terute, should accompany her on the flute. The emperor sat on a raised dais before which was hung a curtain of finely sliced bamboo and purple tassels so that his majesty might see all and not be seen for no ordinary subject was allowed to look upon his sacred face. Hase Hime was a skilled musician though so young and often astonished her masters by her wonderful memory and talent. On this momentous occasion, she played well, but Princess Terute, her stepmother, who was a lazy woman and never took the trouble to practice daily, broke down in her accompaniment and had to request one of the court ladies to take her place. This was a great disgrace and she was furiously jealous to think that she had failed where her stepdaughter succeeded. And to make matters worse, the emperor sent many beautiful gifts to the little princess to reward her for playing so well at the palace. There was also now another reason why Princess Terute hated her stepdaughter, for she had had the good fortune to have a son born to her. And in her inmost heart, she kept saying, If only Hasehime were not here my son would have all the love of his father. And never having learned to control herself, she allowed this wicked thought to grow into the awful desire of taking her stepdaughter's life. So one day, she secretly ordered some poison and poisoned some sweet wine. This poisoned wine she put into a bottle. Into another similar bottle, she poured some good wine. It was the occasion of the boys' festival on the 5th of May and Hasehime was playing with her little brother. All his toys of warriors and heroes were spread out and she was telling him wonderful stories about each of them. They were both enjoying themselves and laughing merrily with their attendants when his mother entered with the two bottles of wine and some delicious cakes. You are both so good and happy, said the wicked Princess Tirute with a smile, that I have brought you some sweet wine as a reward, and here are some nice cakes for my good children. And she filled two cups from the different bottles. Hasehime, never dreaming of the dreadful part her stepmother was taking, took one of the cups of wine and gave to her little stepbrother the other that had been poured out for him. The wicked woman had carefully marked the poisoned bottle, but on coming into the room she had grown nervous and pouring out the wine hurriedly had unconsciously given the poisoned cup to her own child. All this time she was anxiously watching the little princess, but to her amazement no change whatever took place in the young girl's face. Suddenly the little boy screamed and threw himself on the floor, doubled up with pain. His mother flew to him, 
taking the precaution to upset the two tiny jars of wine which she had brought into the room and lifted him up. The attendants rushed for the doctor, but nothing could save the child. He died within the hour in his mother's arms. Doctors did not know much in those ancient times, and it was thought that the wine had disagreed with the boy, causing convulsions of which he died. Thus was the wicked woman punished in losing her own child when she had tried to do away with her stepdaughter. But instead of blaming herself, she began to hate Hasehime even more than ever in the bitterness and wretchedness of her own heart, and she eagerly watched for an opportunity to do her harm, which was, however, long in coming. When Hasehime was 13 years of age, she had already become mentioned as a poetess of some merit. This was an accomplishment very much cultivated by the women of old Japan and one held in high esteem. It was the rainy season at Nara and floods were reported every day as doing damage in the neighborhood. The river Tatsuta, which flowed through the imperial palace grounds, was swollen to the top of its banks and the roaring of the torrents of water rushing along a narrow bed so disturbed the emperor's rest day and night that a serious nervous disorder was the result. An imperial edict was sent forth to all the Buddhist temples, commanding the priests to offer up continuous prayers to heaven to stop the noise of the flood. But this was of no avail. Then it was whispered in court circles that the Princess Hase, the daughter of Prince Toyonari Fujiwara, second minister at court, was the most gifted poetess of the day, though still so young, and her masters confirmed the report. Long ago, a beautiful and gifted maiden poetess had moved heaven by praying in verse, had brought down rain upon a land famished with drought. So said the ancient biographers of the poetess Ono no Komachi. If the Princess Hase were to write a poem and offer it in prayer, might it not stop the noise of the rushing river and remove the cause of the imperial illness? What the court said at last reached the ears of the emperor himself, and he sent an immediate order to the minister, Prince Toyonari, to this effect. Great indeed was Hasehime's fear and astonishment when her father sent for her and told her what was required of her. Heavy indeed was the duty that was laid on her young shoulders, that of saving the emperor's life by the merit of her verse. At last the day came and her poem was finished. It was written on a leaflet of paper heavily flecked with gold dust. With her father and attendants and some of the court officials, she proceeded to the bank of the roaring torrent and raising up her heart to heaven, she read the poem she had composed aloud, lifting it heavenwards in her two hands. Strange indeed it seemed to all those standing around. The waters ceased their roaring and the river was quiet in direct answer to her prayer. After this, the emperor soon recovered his health. His majesty was highly pleased and sent for her to the palace and rewarded her with the rank of Chinjo, that of lieutenant general, to distinguish her. From that time, she was called Chinjo Hime or the lieutenant general princess and respected and loved by all. There was only one person who was not pleased at Hasehime's success. That one was her stepmother. Forever brooding over the death of her own child, whom she had killed when trying to poison her stepdaughter, she had the mortification of seeing her rise to power and honor, marked by imperial favor and the admiration of the whole court. Her envy and jealousy burned in her heart like fire. 
Many were the lies she carried to her husband about Hasehime, but all to no purpose. He would listen to none of her tales, telling her sharply that she was quite mistaken. At last, the stepmother, seizing the opportunity of her husband's absence, ordered one of her old servants to take the innocent girl to the Hibari Mountains, the wildest part of the country, and to kill her there. She invented a dreadful story about the little princess, saying that this was the only way to prevent disgrace falling upon the family, by killing her. Katoda, her vassal, was bound to obey his mistress. Anyhow, he saw it would be the wisest plan to pretend obedience in the absence of the girl's father, so he placed Hasehame in a palanquin and accompanied her to the most solitary place he could find in the wild district. The poor child knew there was no good in protesting to her unkind stepmother at being sent away in this strange manner. So she went as she was told. But the old servant knew that the young princess was quite innocent of all the things her stepmother had invented to him as reasons for her outrageous orders, and he determined to save her life. Unless he killed her, however, he could not return to his cruel task mistress, so he decided to stay out in the wilderness. With the help of some peasants, he soon built a little cottage and having sent secretly for his wife to come, these two good old people did all in their power to take care of the now unfortunate princess. She all the time trusted in her father, knowing that as soon as he returned home and found her absent, he would search for her. Prince Toyonari, after some weeks, came home and was told by his wife that his daughter Hime had done something wrong and had run away for fear of being punished. He was nearly ill with anxiety. Everyone in the house told the same story, that Hase Hime had suddenly disappeared. None of them knew why or whither. For fear of scandal, he kept the matter quiet and searched everywhere he could think of, but all to no purpose. One day, trying to forget his terrible worry, he called all his men together and told them to make ready for a several days hunt in the mountains. They were soon ready and mounted, waiting at the gate for their lord. He rode hard and fast to the district of the Hibari Mountains, a great company following him. He was soon far ahead of everyone and at last found himself in a narrow, picturesque valley. Looking around and admiring the scenery, he noticed a tiny house on one of the hills quite near and then he distinctly heard a beautiful, clear voice reading aloud. Seized with curiosity as to who could be studying so diligently in such a lonely spot, he dismounted and leaving his horse to his groom, he walked up the hillside and approached the cottage. As he drew nearer, his surprise increased, for he could see that the reader was a beautiful girl. The cottage was wide open and she was sitting facing the view. Listening attentively, he heard her reading the Buddhist scriptures with great devotion. More and more curious, he hurried on to the tiny gate and entered the little garden, and looking up, beheld his lost daughter, Hase Hime. She was so intent on what she was saying that she neither heard nor saw her father till he spoke. Hase Hime, he cried, is it you, my Hase Hime? Taken by surprise, she could hardly realize that it was her own dear father who was calling her, and for a moment she was utterly bereft of the power to speak or move. My father, my father, it is indeed you. Oh, my father, was all she could say. And running to him, she caught hold of his thick sleeve and bearing her face burst into a passion of tears. 
Her father stroked her dark hair, asking her gently to tell him all that had happened. But she only wept on, and he wondered if he were not really dreaming. Then the faithful old servant, Katoda, came out, and bowing himself to the ground before his master, poured out the long tale of wrong, telling him all that had happened and how it was that he found his daughter in such a wild and desolate spot with only two old servants to take care of her. The prince's astonishment and indignation knew no bounds. He gave up the hunt at once and hurried home with his daughter. One of the company galloped ahead to inform the household of the glad news, and the stepmother, hearing what had happened, and fearful of meeting her husband now that her wickedness was discovered, fled from the house and returned in disgrace to her father's roof, and nothing more was heard of her. The old servant Katoda was rewarded with the highest promotion in his master's service, and lived happily to the end of his days, devoted to the little princess, who never forgot that she owed her life to this faithful retainer. She was no longer troubled by an unkind stepmother, and her days passed happily and quietly with her father. As Prince Tayonari had no son, he adopted a younger son of one of the court nobles to be his heir and to marry his daughter Hasehime, and in a few years the marriage took place. Hasehime lived to a good old age, and all said that she was the wisest, most devout, and most beautiful mistress that had ever reigned in Prince Tayonari's ancient house. She had the joy of presenting her son, the future lord of the family, to her father just before he retired from active life. To this day, there is a preserved piece of needlework in one of the Buddhist temples of Kyoto. It is a beautiful piece of tapestry with the figure of Buddha embroidered in the silky threads drawn from the stem of the lotus. This is said to have been the work of the hands of the good Princess Hase. End of the story of Princess Hase, a story of old Japan in Myths and Legends Around the World, Collection 13. How the Wicked Sons Were Duped In Myths and Legends Around the World Collection 13 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org How the Wicked Sons Were Duped by Joseph Jacobs a very wealthy old man, imagining that he was on the point of death, sent for his sons and divided his property among them. However, he did not die for several years afterwards, and miserable years many of them were. Besides the weariness of old days, the old fellow had to bear with much abuse and cruelty from his sons, wretched selfish ingrates. Previously, they vied with one another in trying to please their father, hoping thus to receive more money, but now they had received their patrimony, they cared not how soon he left them. Nay, the sooner the better, because he was only a needless trouble and expense, and they let the poor old men know what they felt. One day, he met a friend and related to him all his troubles. The friend sympathized very much with him and promised to think over the matter and call in a little while and tell him what to do. He did so. In a few days, he visited the old man and put down four bags full of stones and gravel before him. 
Look here, friend, said he. Your sons will get to know of my coming here today and will inquire about it. You must pretend that I came to discharge a long-standing debt with you and that you are several thousands of rupees richer than you thought you were. Keep these bags in your own hands and on no account let your sons get to them as long as you are alive. You will soon find them change their conduct towards you. Salam, I will come again soon to see how you are getting on. When the young man got to hear of his further increase of wealth, they began to be more attentive and pleasing to their father than ever before, and thus they continued to the day of the old man's demise when the bags were greedily opened and found to contain only stones and gravel. End of How the Wicked Sons Were Duped In Myths and Legends Around the World Collection 13 Read by Chinmay Kumar Hota, Bhubaneswar, India The 13th December 2021Setuli, or the King of the Birds, in Myths and Legends Around the World, Collection 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jerome Ware. Setuli, or the King of the Birds. Setuli, or The King of the Birds, A Swazi Tale Many, many years ago, there lived a poor man named Setuli, who was deaf and dumb. He had never been able to speak or understand anything but signs from his birth, and was despised by all his brothers and sisters. Although he was the son of a powerful chief, no one much looked at him, and he could never hope to win a bride or have a home of his own. He had but one friend, an elder brother, who gave him food and shelter and was always kind to him. This brother was already old and was known as a great magician. He knew the properties of every herb and the wonderful powers possessed by the birds and beasts. When he went to search for magic roots, he always took Satuli with him, for he found his eyes were quicker than those of any man in the countryside and his fingers more deft. One day in spring, when the first rains had fallen and green shoots were showing among the dry grass, the two brothers went out to gather roots as usual. They traveled far into the mountains till they reached a narrow valley full of trees just bursting into leaf. A clear stream ran down one side among great boulders. Ferns were just uncurling their early fronds, and in sheltered nooks, big scarlet daisies shone like tiny suns. The old magician in Satuli set to work at once, for here, many rare plants flourished. They had been at work for an hour or more when a swarm of beautiful black birds with long waving tails came towards them, flying in a zigzag course. They settled on the low bushes, swinging up and down on the branches and balancing their long tails. The two brothers both looked up, and in a grave voice the old magician said to the birds, Sakubalas, we go to sleep and we get up as we used to do. This was the magic greeting they expected. I cannot tell you what it meant, but when the Sokobulas heard it, they flew away quite satisfied. The two brothers went on digging and moved farther up the stream. Then, a great swarm of dear little Ruibeki suddenly appeared, tiny little brown birds with pink breast and bright red bills. They fluttered all around, chattering gaily. The old magician again looked up. Mansiane, he said, we go to sleep, and we get up as we used to do. The Ruibekis flew away quite satisfied. Then the two brothers went on digging again and worked for a long time. All at once there rushed upon them an immense flight of the most beautiful birds, shining from head to foot with glorious yellow plumage. Round their necks showed a ring of velvety black, and there were black feathers in their wings. Follow us up, 
follow us up, they cried to the two brothers. These are Orioles, said the old magician. Without a doubt, some great adventure is before us. He signed to his brother to leave the roots and follow the birds. They traveled over the mountains for three days and three nights, following the golden birds. On the morning of the fourth day, the birds led them down a steep mountainside to a deep green valley through which ran a wide stream. The birds followed the stream till they came to a deep, clear pool under the shadow of great trees. It was very cool and very still. Tall reeds and big white lilies grew all around the water's edge, and over the pool itself were hundreds of water lilies, white and purple. The golden birds turned to the magician and said, Bring your brother here, and tell him on no account to be afraid, no matter what may happen to him. He must wait by the edge of the pool amongst the reeds and lilies. The elder brother fetched a tuli and made him understand what was wanted of him. Then he went away and left his brother alone, wondering what this new adventure would bring. Now though Satuli had always been despised and set aside by all his relations, he was in reality both wise and brave. He sat down at the water's edge and remained perfectly still. Suddenly the waters moved and up rose a huge alligator. It came straight towards him, lashing its great tail and opening its huge jaws. Its teeth glistened in the sun, and as it walked up the bank, it snapped at Satuli and blinked its wicked little eyes. But Satuli sat perfectly still and pretended not to notice. The alligator thrust its long nose almost in his face, snapped his jaws once more, and then seeing he showed no sign of fear, turned tail and slipped into the pool again. Satuli remained sitting, waiting to see what would happen next. For a little while the pool was still. Then the whole of the waters moved, and out came a huge ogre, far more hideous and terrible than an alligator. He was covered with eyes and glared with every one of them at the deaf man. Then he roared fiercely and sprang towards him. But still, Satuli did not move as much as an eyelid. The ogre shouted again, and then disappeared like the alligator before him. After that, there was no sound or motion for many hours. Satuli sat watching by the pool. Just as he began to think nothing more would happen, the water moved quietly, and out came a fairy in the shape of an old woman. She stood in the waters up to her waist and gazed at Satuli. On her right hand, there perched a beautiful black Sokobola. On her left hand, a little Roebeki and on her head was a most wonderful oreo, bright as the rising moon. The old woman continued to gaze at Satuli, and said three times in a loud voice, Speak! When she uttered the third word, Satuli felt a new power had come to him. He could speak like other people, and he could understand all the fairy said. Go to your brother, she said, and show him you are cured. I have known both of you long, and have determined to help you. Whatever you want in the future you shall receive. You have only to ask for it. The fairy vanished, and the three birds flew away. Satuli soon found his brother, and the old man's astonishment was great when he heard the deaf man speak. Satuli, in his turn, was much surprised to find the three swarms of birds again, just as he had left them on his journey out. They flew in three separate companies, and at the head of each company was one more beautiful than the others evidently the leader. Satuli soon saw these were the very birds who had accompanied the fairy. No doubt she had sent them for his use. He thought deeply for a time, and then made new plans. The result you shall soon hear. The two brothers journeyed on till they saw a great storm rising. The sky was blue-black, and a noise could be heard like a continuous thunder. That is hail, cried the magician. We should be caught here in the open. Nothing can save us from death. Do not fear, said Satuli. Wait, and you shall see. He gave a command, and instantly one thousand huts appeared. His brother gazed in astonishment and delight. Then he said, What do we want with so many huts? There is no one to shelter but you and me. I shall want huts for my soldiers and people, said Satuli. Then he turned to the companies of birds and changed them all with one word into warriors. The Sokobas came his first regiment. They were great tall men, clad in leopard skins, holding in their hands assegais, 
and huge shields of oxhide. But one thing remained of their former state. Each man wore on his head a huge cap of the long tail feathers of the Socobola. They stood in line, saluted their chief, and marched to their huts. Then came the golden orioles. These were Satuli's bodyguard, and were even finer than the Socobolas. Their skins were of the silver jackal. Round their knees and arms were bracelets of white oxtails, and on their heads were long black ostrich plumes. Before them stood the golden oriole, bright as a rising moon, now the general in command next to Satuli himself. Last of all came the Ruribekis. These became the little umfans, the lads who carry out the baggage of the army and wait on the grown men. Satuli sent them all to their huts just as the first hailstones struck the ground. For an hour, no one stirred. The sound of the storm was like continuous roaring thunder. The hailstones were as large as great plums, jagged and sharp as crystals. Every tree was stripped of its leaves, and all birds and beasts who could not find shelter were killed or maimed. When the storm ceased, the hell lay in icy heaps in every hollow, and the air was frosty and cold as midwinter on the high mountains. A raw mist rose from the valleys, but Satuli felt no cold. His heart was great within him, for now he had proved his powers. He called out his troops once more and reviewed them with joy and pride. We shall go forth and conquer a great kingdom, he said to his brother. I shall be a rich man. The regiment shouted, Bayeda, the salute which is given only to the chief, and swore to follow wherever Satuli led. Generals were appointed for each division of the army, the three leaders being the birds who sat at the fairy's hands. There was no trouble about provisions or shelter, for Satuli had only to ask for food, and there was abundance for all. He now determined to search for a kingdom to conquer. He left the country of mountains and wooded valleys, and went up to the great tableland to search for new people to overcome. He traveled with his army for a year, but never saw so much as one little hut. The land was empty. On every side was waving grass, extending as far as eye could reach. But no path appeared, nor any tree. Great herds of bucks sometimes came towards them, and then followed fine hunting. But no man or woman could they find, though they traveled for many months. At last, they turned back toward the low country, and at the end of a year they came to a range of mountains overlooking an immense plain. Below, they saw great cities surrounded by fields full of mealies. Thousands of cattle roamed on the hills. They had but to descend and seize all they wanted. Satuli bade his men camp in a great valley, which could not be seen from the plain. Then he sent spies to find out how strong the cities were and how big was the king's army. But first his brother the magician gave them a wonderful potion which made them invisible so that no one should suspect them. In the evening they returned in great fear. The people, cried they, are all deaf and dumb. They have but one arm and walk on only one leg. Not only that, but as soon as we approached them, we found we were becoming deaf and dumb also, so we ran back as quickly as possible. This troubled Satuli very much. Don't go near these people, said he. Let us get right away from the towns and go hunting in the mountains. Now Satuli was very wise, and had besides the advice of his brother, the great magician. He had determined to take possession of all the inhabitants of the country and drive away all their cattle, but he felt sure some powerful monster ruled over them who would first have to be discovered and destroyed. The only thing to do was to devise some means of attracting him to the camp and killing him unawares. A big hunt was arranged, and an immense number of birds were taken of all shapes and colors. Satuli drew a feather out of the tail of every bird and made a huge many-colored ball, which he wore as a headrest and as protection for himself, for magic power was in the feathers. Then he allowed preparations to be made for a great feast which followed the hunt but gave special direction to his men. Do not eat all the birds, he said. Place half of those you have killed in front of the huts. Put first a whole bird, then the head of a bird you have eaten, in long rolls all around the camp. 
and then put a treble roll about my own hut. The men carried out these commands carefully, and soon the whole camp was surrounded with dead birds of every hue and shape. When all the feasting was over, and the camp quite still, Satuli crept out of his hut and hid behind the screen which sheltered the entrance. It was full moon, and the country shone like silver. Sharp, inky black shadows showed near the river where the bushes grew, and around each hut was a dark, narrow ring in which no object was visible. Satuli crouched behind his screen of reeds. The camp was absolutely still and deserted. Towards midnight, he heard heavy footsteps approaching. Every now and then they stopped, then they began again. Satuli stooped lower. Without doubt, the monster who owned all the cities in the plain was approaching. The footsteps were not even. They resembled someone hopping very heavily. Presently, a huge black figure came in sight, holding a long asagai. He had but one leg and one arm, and stopped greedily at every hut to eat the bird which lay there. As he came nearer, Satuli saw that he was of an unimaginable ugliness. His eyes were divided. One was in the middle of his forehead and the other at the back of his head, so that whichever way he stood, he saw you, and you could not escape him. At the entrance of Satuli's hut, he stopped, gave a snarl of delight at the sight of so many birds, and sat down to enjoy them. He had but one arm, so he laid his asagai down just before the door screen. Satuli asked for no better chance. He rose quickly, seized the asagai, and stabbed the monster in the neck. He rolled over with a groan, and lay quite still, apparently dead. With a joyous heart, Satuli roused all his men, and at the break of day led them into the great plain. To their surprise, they found the people walking on two legs, and talking as well as themselves. The death of the ogre relieved the people from the bonds of a wicked enchantment, and they were only too glad to go with Satuli and his men they and all their cattle. By evening all was in order for the march, and at the earliest dawn the company started for the mountains. They had gone a whole day's journey and had reached a point high above the great plain when Satuli discovered that he had lost his ball of feathers. He did not wish to turn his followers back, but neither could he bear to travel farther without his headdress, for it had magic power and it might be long before he could get such another. So he bade his army go on under the leadership of his brother and went down to the mountain path as fast as possible till he came to the valley in which they had camped. There he saw a sight which made his heart stand still. The ogre whom he had left for dead was sitting up alive and well, and around him danced and romped hundreds of little ogres, all with one leg and one arm like their father. They tossed the magic ball of feathers from one to another and shouted with glee. Satuli saw he must risk all and trust his swift feet to get away. He ran in suddenly, seized the ball of feathers, and turned quickly away up the mountain path. As he touched the ball, all the little ogres vanished like smoke. Only the big one remained, and for a moment he was dazed and did not understand what had happened. Then he got up and stamped after Satuli with astonishing speed. It was all Satuli could do to keep the distance between them, but he was strong and knew the paths. They leapt from rock to rock, in and out among the trees, till they came to the grassy slope which led to the great pass. They climbed all day till the sun began to set. Then, at the very top of the mountain range, Satuli found his army camped along the side of a deep ravine. Below was a valley many hundreds of feet deep, lined with huge rocks and great trees. Beyond, many weary hours away, rose another mountain with green slopes marked with the course of many streams. Bayeta, cried the army when they saw their chief. My men, cried Satuli, we have not a moment to lose. Our enemy is behind us and we shall soon be in his hands. Let every man, woman, and child fix his eyes on the mountainside opposite and then leap with all his might. Satuli could hear his enemy behind him as his people leapt together into the air. He ran forward, touched the cattle with his ball of feathers, and they too jumped with all their might. All landed safely on the other side and placed the great ravine between them and the terrible ogre. Satuli jumped last, just as the monster, breathless and exhausted, reached the edge of the precipice. 
Twilight set in, and when the sun rose next morning, Satuli and all his people found themselves in perfect safety and set forth once more on their journey. They traveled all day, and at sunset came to the most beautiful valley they had ever beheld. It lay far below them, wide, green, and fertile. Down its center flowed a clear stream, shaded by great tree ferns and bordered with thick green bushes covered with scarlet flowers. The valley extended as far as I could see towards the setting sun. All the hills on either side were closely wooded and well watered. Satuli turned to his brother and said, This is the finest country I've ever seen. We will settle here with all our men. At the end of the valley was a very large crawl wherein dwelt the chief of the country. Satuli determined to win him over to his side and make him his man. So he took his bodyguard and marched down the mountain paths to the gate of the crawl. Just as they approached the chief's hut, he struck every one of his men on the leg with his magic assegai. They at once began to walk every man on one leg. Never have I seen such magic power, said the chief. You shall be our king and protect us against all our enemies. I will show you yet more marvels, said Zaduli. He struck his men once more, and they all walked like ordinary human beings. While the chief still stared in open-mouthed wonder, he turned to the mountainside and shouted, Men, appear! Instantly, from top to bottom of the great hill, stood line upon line of magnificent warriors, clad in leopard skins and holding white shields. They lifted their right hands and shouted, Bayeta! so that the cry echoed like thunder from side to side of the valley. Then Satuli shouted once more, Men disappear! And at once the hillside was empty and silent. You see, said Satuli, I have men at my command whenever we need them. You shall certainly be our king, cried all the people. So Satuli and his brother, and all the men and women who belonged to them, stayed in the valley and lived in great peace and happiness all their lives long. End of story in Myths and Legends Around the World, Collection 13. Read by Jerome Ware, San Diego, December 20th, 2021. Arabian Society in the Middle Ages. Chapter 1, Religion in Myths and Legends Around the World, Collection 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The confession of the Muslim's faith is briefly made in these words. There is no deity but God, Muhammad is God's apostle, which imply a belief and observance of everything that Muhammad taught to be the word or will of God. In the opinion of those who are commonly called orthodox and termed Sunnis, the Muhammadan code is founded upon the Quran, the traditions of the Prophet, the concordance of his principal early disciples, and the decisions which have been framed from analogy or comparison. The Sunnis consist of four sects, Hanafis, Shafiris, Malikis, and Hanbalis, so called after the names of their respective founders. The other sects, who are called Shiais, an appellation particularly given to the Persian sect, but also used to designate generally all who are not Sunnis, are regarded in the same, in nearly the same light as those who do not profess al-Islam, the Muhammadan faith, that is, as destined to eternal punishment. The Muhammadan faith embraces the following points. Belief in God, who is without beginning or end, the sole creator and lord of the universe, having absolute power, and knowledge and glory and perfection. Belief in his angels who are impeccable beings created of light and jinn who are peccable created of smokeless fire. The devils whose chief is Iblis or Satan are evil jinni. Belief in his prophets and apostles, the most distinguished of whom are Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Jesus is held to be more excellent than any of those who preceded him to have been born of a virgin and to be the Messiah and the word of God and the spirit proceeding from him. But not partaking of his essence and not to be called the son of God, Muhammad is held to be more excellent than all, the last and greatest of prophets and apostles, the most excellent of the creatures of God. Belief in his scriptures, which are his uncreated word, 
revealed to his prophets. Of these there now exist, but held to be greatly corrupted, the Pentateuch of Moses, the Psalms of David, and the Gospels of Jesus Christ, and in an uncorrupted and incorruptible state, the Quran, which is held to have abrogated and to surpass in excellence all preceding revelations, belief in the general resurrection and judgment and in future rewards and punishments, chiefly of a corporeal nature. The punishments will be eternal to all but wicked Muhammadans, and none but Muhammadans will enter into a state of happiness. Belief in God's predestination of all events, both good and evil. The belief in fate and destiny, al-Qada wal-Qadar, exercises a most powerful influence upon the actions and character of the Muslims. Many hold that Faith is in some respects absolute and unchangeable, in others admitting of alteration, and almost all of them act in many of the affairs of life as if this were their belief. In the former case, it is called al-qada al-muhkam, in the latter, al-qada al-mubrab, which term, without the explanation here given, might be regarded as exactly synonymous with the former. Hence the Prophet it is said, prayed to be preserved from the latter, as knowing that it might be changed. And in allusion to this in, in and in allusion to this changeable fate, we are told, God says, God will cancel what he pleaseth and confirm, while on the contrary the faith which is termed muhkam is appointed destiny, decreed by God. Many doctors have argued that destiny respects only the final state of a certain portion of men, believers and unbelievers, and that, in general, man is endowed with free will, which he should exercise according to the laws of God and his own conscience and judgment, praying to God for a blessing on his endeavors, or imploring the intercession of the prophet or any of the saints in his favor, and propitiating um, them by offering alms or sacrifices in their names, relying upon God for the result which he may then and then only attribute to fate or destiny. They hold, therefore, that it is criminal to attempt resistance to the will when it dictates are conformable with the laws of God and our natural consciousnesses and prudence, and so passively to await the fulfillment of God's decrees. The doctrine of the Qur'an and the traditions respecting the decrees of God or fate and destiny appears, however, to be that they are although altogether absolute and unchangeable, written in the beginning of the creation on the preserved tablet in heaven, that God hath predestined every event and action, evil as well as good, at the same time commanding and approving good, and forbidding and hating evil, and that the cancelling mentioned in the preceding paragraph relates, as the context seems to show, to the abrogation of former scriptures or revelations, not of fate. But still, it must be held that he hath not predestined the will, though he sometimes inclines it to good, and the devil sometimes inclines it to evil. It is asked, then, if we have the power to will, but not the power to perform otherwise, then, as God hath predetermined, how can we be regarded as responsible beings? The answer to this is that our actions are judged good or evil according to our intentions. If we have faith, good actions, or intentions, it should be added only increase and do not cause our happiness if we are believers and evil actions or intentions only increase our misery if we are unbelievers or irreligious for the muslim holds that he is to be admitted into heaven only by the mercy of god on account of his faith and to be rewarded in proportion to his good works the prophet's assertions on the subject of god's decrees are considered of the highest importance as explanatory of the quran Whatever is in the universe, said he, is by the order of God. God hath preordained five things on his servants, the duration of life, their actions, their dwelling places, their travels, and their portions. There is not one among you whose sitting place is not written by God, whether in the fire or in paradise. Some of the companions of the prophet, on hearing the last quoted saying, asked him, O prophet, since God hath appointed our places, may we confide in this and abandon our religious and moral duties. He answered, no, because the happy will do good works, and those who are of miserable will do bad works. The following of his sayings further illustrate this subject. When God hath ordered a creature to die in any particular place, he causeth his wants to direct him to that place. A companion asked, 
O prophet of God, inform me respecting charms and the medicines which I swallow and shields which I make use of for protection, whether they prevent any of the orders of God. Muhammad answered, These also are by the order of God. There is a medicine for every pain. Then when the Muslim reaches the pain, it is cured by the order of God. When a Muslim therefore feels an inclination to make use of the medicine for the cure of a disease, he should do so in the hope of it being predestined that he shall so he shall be so cured. On the predestination of diseases, I find the following curious quotation and remark in a manuscript work by El Sayuti, who wrote in the 15th century in my possession. El Halimi says, Communicable or contagious diseases are six smallpox, measles, itch or scab, foul breath or putridity, melancholy and pestilential maladies, and diseases engendered are also six leprosy, hectic, epilepsy, um, gout, elephantiasis, and flusius. But this does not contradict the saying of the prophet, there is no transition of diseases by contagion or infection, nor any omen that brings evil. For the transition here meant is one occasioned by the disease itself, whereas the effect is of God, who causes a pestilence to spread when there is intercourse with the diseased. A Bedawi asked the prophet, what is the condition of camels when stay in, which stay in the desert? Verily you might say they are dear in health and in cleanliness of skin. Then they mix with mangy camels, and they become mangy also. Muhammad said, what made the first camel mangy? Notwithstanding, however, the arguments which have been here adduced, and many others that might have been that might be added, declaring or implying the unchangeable nature of all of God's decrees, I, found, I have found it to be the opinion of my own Muslim friends that God may be induced by supplication to change certain of his decrees, at least those regarding decrees, degrees of happiness or misery in this world and the next, and that such is the general opinion appears from a form of prayer which is repeated in the mosques on the eve of the middle or 15th day of the month of Shaban, when it is believed that such portions of God's decrees are constitute as the destinies of all living creatures for the ensuing year are confirmed and fixed. In this prayer it is said, O God, if thou hast recorded me in thy abode upon the original of the book, the preserved tablet, miserable or fortunate or scanted in my sustenance, cancel, O God, of thy goodness, my misery and misfortune and scanty allowance of sustenance, and confirm me in thy abode upon the original of the book as happy and provided for and directed to good, etc. The Arabs in general constantly have recourse both to charms and medicines, not only for the cure, but also for the prevention of diseases. They have indeed a strange passion for medicine, which shows that they do not consider fate as altogether unconditional. Nothing can exceed the earnestness with which they often press a European traveler for a dose, and the more violent the remedy, the better they are pleased. Um, the following case will serve as an example. Three donkey drivers conveying the luggage of two British travelers from Bulak to Cairo opened a bottle which they observed in a basket and finding it to contain, as they had suspected, brandy, emptied, in t emptied it down their throats. But he who had the last draught on turning up the bottle got the tail of the scorpion into his mouth and looking through the bottle to his great horror saw that it contained a number of these reptiles with tarantulas vipers and beetles thinking that they had poisoned themselves not liking to rely upon fate they persuaded a man to come to me for medicine he introduced the subject by saying o effendi do an act of kindness there are three men poisoned in your mercy give them medicine and save their lives and then he related the whole affair without concealing the theft I answered that they did not deserve medicine, but he urged that by giving it, I should con obtain an immense reward. Yes, said I, he who saveth a soul alive shall be as if he had saved the lives of all mankind. I said this to try um, the feeling of the applicants, who, expressing admiration of my knowledge, urged me to be quick, lest the men should uh, die, thus showing himself to be no unconditional fatalist. I gave him three strong doses of tartar emetic, and he soon came back to me to thank me, saying that the medicine was most admirable for the men had hardly swallowed it when they almost vomited their hearts and livers and everything else in their bodies. From a distrust in fate, some Muslims even shut themselves up during the prevalence of plague. But this practice is generally condemned. A Syrian friend of mine who did so nearly 
had his door broken uh, open by his neighbors. Another of my friends, one of the most distinguished of the ulama, uh, confessed to me his conviction of the lawfulness of quarantine and argued well in favor of it, but said that he dared not openly avow such an opinion. The apostle of God, said he, God favor and preserve him, have commanded that we should not enter a city where there is pestilence nor go out from it. What, why did he say enter it not? Because by doing, by, by so doing, we should expose ourselves to the disease. Why did he say go not out from it? Because by doing, by so doing, we should carry the disease to others. The prophet was tenderly considerate of our welfare, but the present Muslims in general are like bulls, brute beasts. And they hold the meaning of this command to be go not into a city where there is pestilence because this would be rashness and go not out from it because this would be distrusting God's power to save you from it. Many of the vulgar and ignorant among modern Muslims believe that the unchangeable destinies of every man are written upon his head in what are termed the sutures of the skull. The principal ritual and moral laws are on the following subjects of which the first four are the most important. Prayer, as salah including perpetuary purifications. There are partial or total washings to be performed on particularly particular occasions which need not be described. The ablution, which is more especially preparatory to prayer and which is called wudu, consists in washing the hands, mouth, nostril, face, arms, as high as the elbow, the right first, each three times, and then the upper part of the head, the beard, ears, neck, and feet, each once. This is done with running water or from a very large tank or from a lake or the sea. Prayers are required to be performed five times in the course of every day, between daybreak and sunrise, between noon and the asr, which latter period is about midtime between noon and nightfall, between the asr and the sunset, between sunset and daisha, or the period when darkness of night commences. And at or after the isha, the commencement of each of these periods is announced by a chant called adhan, repeated by a crier, the mu'adhan, from the Medina or Minara of each mosque, and it is more um, meritorious to commence the prayer than, uh, than at a later time. On each of these occasions, the Muslim has to perform certain prayers held to be ordained by God and others ordained by the Prophet, each consisting of two, three, or four rakahs, which sig term signifies the repetition of a set of form of words, chiefly from the Qur'an, and ejaculations of God is most great, etc., accompanied by particular postures, parts of the words being repeated in an erect posture, part sitting and part in other postures, an inclination of the head and body, followed by two prostrations, distinguishing each rakah. The prayers... Um, may in some cases be abridged and in others entirely omitted. Other prayers must be performed on particular occasions. On Friday, Muhammad and Sabbath, um, there are congressional, um, congregational prayers, which are similar to those of other days, which additional prayers and exhortations by a minister who is called Imam or Khatib, the Salam or salutation of Friday, a form of blessing on the Prophet and his family and companions is chanted by the Mu'addinin, of, um, from the Medinas of the congressional mosques half an hour before noon. The worshippers begin, begin to assemble in the mosque as soon as they hear it and arranging themselves in rows parallel to and facing that side in which is the niche that marks the um, direction of Mecca. Each performs by himself the prayers of two rakahs which are supererogatory and then sits in his place while a reader recites part or the whole of the 18th chapter of the Qur'an. As the call of noon, they all stand up and each again performs separately the prayers of two rakahs ordained by the Prophet. A minister standing at the foot of the pulpit stairs then proposes to bless the Prophet and accordingly a second salam is chanted by uh, one or more of the ministers stationed at an elevated platform. After this, the former minister and the latter um, after repeats after him repeat the call of noon, which the Mu'addinin bef have before chanted from the Medinas, and the former enjoys his silence. The Khatib has already seated himself on the top step or platform of the pulpit. He now rises and recites a khutbah of praise to God and exhortions um, to the congregation, and if in a country or a town acquired by arms from unbelievers, he holds a wooden sword 
resting its points on the ground. Each of the congregation next offers up some private supplication, after which the khatib recites a second khutbah, um, which is always the same, or nearly so, in part resembling the first, but chiefly a prayer for the Prophet and his family and for the general welfare of the Muslims. This finished, the khatib descends from the pulpit and stationed before the niche after a form of words differing slightly from the call to prayer has been chanted by the ministers on the elevated platform before mentioned recites the divinely ordained prayers of Friday to the guys while the people do the same silently, keeping time with him exactly in the various postures. Thus are completed the Friday prayers, but some of the congregation remain and perform the ordinarily divinely ordained prayers of noon. Other occasions for special prayer are the two grand annual festivals, the Nights of Ramadan, um, the month of abstinence, the occasion of an eclipse of the sun or moon for rain, previously to the commencement of battle in pil pilgrimage and at funerals, to almsgiving. Um, an alms called zakat is required by law to be given annually to the poor of camels, oxen, bulls, and cows, and buffaloes, sheep and goats, horses and mules and asses and gold and silver, whether in money or in vessels, ornaments, etc., provided the property be of a certain amount, as five camels, thirty oxen, forty sheep, five horses, two hundred dirhams, or twenty dinars. Um, the proportion is generally one-fortieth, which is to be paid in kind or in money or other equivalent. Fasting, as siyam, the Muslim must abstain from eating and drinking, and from every indulgence of the senses every day during the month of Ramadan, from the first appearance of daybreak until sunset, unless physically incapacitated. On the first day of the following month, a festival called the Minor Festival is observed with public prayer and with general rejoicing, which continues three days. Pilgrimage, Al-Hajj. It is incumbent on the Muslim, if able, to perform at least once in his life the pilgrimage to Mecca and Mount Arafat. The principal ceremonies of the pilgrimage are completed on the ninth month of Dhul Hijjah. On the following day, which is the first of the great festival, on the return of Arafat to Mecca, the pilgrims who are able to do so perform a sacrifice, and every other Muslim who can is required to do the same. Part of the meat of the victim he should eat, and the rest he should give to the poor. The festival is otherwise observed in a similar manner to the minor one above mentioned and lasts three or four days. The less important ritual and moral laws may be briefly mentioned. Um, one of these is circumcision, which is not absolutely obligatory. The distinctions of clean and unclean meats are nearly the same as in Muhammad and as in the Mosaic Code. Camel's flesh is an exception being lawful to the Muslim. Swine's flesh and blood are especially condemned, and a particular mode of slaughtering animals for food is enjoined, accompanied by the repetition of the name of God. Wine and all inebriating liquors are strictly forbidden, so too is gaming. Music is condemned, but most Muslims take great delight in hearing it. Images and pictures representing living creatures are contrary to law. Charity, probity in all transactions, veracity, especially excepting um, in a few cases, and modesty are virtues indispensable. Cleanliness in person and decent attire are particularly required. Clothes of silk and ornaments of gold and silver are forbidden to men but allowed to women. This precept, however, is often disregarded. Utensils of gold and silver are also condemned, yet they are used by many Muslims. The manners of many the manners of Muslims in society are subject to particular rules with respect to salutations, etc. Of the civil laws, the following notices will suffice. A man may have four wives at the same time, and according to common opinion, as many concubine slaves as he pleases. He may divorce a wife twice and each time take her back again. But if he divorces her a third time or by a triple sentence, he cannot make her his wife again unless by her own consent and by a new contract. And after another man has consummated a marriage with her and divorced her. The children of a wife... Um, by a wife and those by a concubine slave inherit equally if the latter be acknowledged by the father sons inherit equally and so do daughters but the share of a wife is half of that of a son one eighth is the share of the wife or the wives of the deceased if he have left issue and one fourth if he have left no issue a husband inherits one fourth of his wife's property and if she have left issue and one half if she have left no issue. The debts and legacies of the deceased must first be paid. A man may leave one third but no more of his property in any way he pleases. When a concubine slave has borne a child to her master, she becomes entitled to her freedom on his death. There are particular laws relating to commerce. Usury and monopoly are especially condemned. 
Of the criminal laws, a few may be briefly mentioned. Murder is punishable by death or a fine to be paid by to the family of the deceased if they prefer it. Theft of the property stolen amounts to a quarter of a dinar is to be punished by cutting off the right hand except under certain circumstances. Adultery, if attested by four eyewitnesses, is punishable by death, stoning, fornication by a hundred stripes, and banishment for a year. Drunkenness is punished with 80 stripes, apostasy preserved in by death. The Quran ordains that murder shall be punished with death, or rather that the free shall die for the free, the slave for the slave, and the woman for the woman, or that the perpetrator of the, for, of the crime shall pay to the heirs of the person whom he has killed if they will allow it a fine, which is to be divided according to the laws of inheritance already explained. It also ordains that unintentional homicide shall be expiated um, by freeing a believer from slavery and paying a fine to the family of the person killed unless they remit it. But these laws are amplified and explained by the same book and by the imams. A fine is not to be accepted for murder unless the, unless the crime has been attended by some palliating circumstance. This fine about the price of blood is a hundred camels or a thousand dinars um, from him who possesses gold, or from him who possesses silver, 12,000 dirhams. This is for killing a free man, for a woman half that sum, for a slave his or her value, but this must fall short of the price of blood for the free. A person unable to free a believer must fast two months as in Ramadan. The accomplices of a murder are liable to the punishment of death. By the sunnah or to the traditions of the prophet, also, a man is obnoxious to capital punishment for the murder of a woman and by the Hanafi law for the murder of his of another man's slave. But he is exempted from this punishment who kills his own child or other descendant or his own slave or his son's slave or a slave of whom he is part owner or also um, so are also his accomplices. Um, and according to a Shafi'i, a Muslim, um, though a slave is not to be put to death for killing an infidel, though the latter um, be free, um, a man who kills another in self-defense or to defend his property from a robber is exempt from all punishment. The price of blood is the debt incumbent on the family, tribe, or association of which the homicide is a member. It also um, it is also incumbent on the inhabitants of an enclosed quarter or the proprietor or proprietors of a field in which the body of a person killed by an unknown hand is found, unless the person has been found killed in his own house. Retaliation for intentional wounds and mutilations is allowed by the Muhammadan law, like as for murder, an eye for an eye, etc. But a fine may be accepted instead, which is which the law allows for un, also for unintentional injuries. The fine for a member that is single, as the nose, is the price, the whole price of blood. And as for homicide, for a member of which that there are two and not more, as a hand, half the price of blood. For one of which there are ten, a finger or a toe, a tenth of the price of blood. But the fine of a man for maiming or wounding a woman is half of that for the same injury to a man. And that of a free person for injuring a slave varies according to the value of the slave. The fine for depriving a man of any of his five senses or dangerously wounding him or grievously disfiguring him for life is the whole price of blood. The Muhammadan law ordains that a person who is adult and of sound mind, if he steals an article of the value of a quarter of a dinar or a piece of gold from a place to which he has not ordinary or free access, shall lose his right hand. But this punishment is not to be inflicted for stealing a free child or anything um, which in the eye of a law is of no pecuniary value as wine or a musical instrument. And there are some other cases in which the thief is not to be so punished. For the second offense, the left foot is to be cut off, and for the third and subsequent offenses, according to the Hanafi Code, the culprit is to be punished by a long imprisonment, or the Shafari law, for the third offense, he is to lose his left hand, and for the fourth, his right foot, and for, no, and for further offenses, he is to be flogged or beaten. The punishment is the same for a woman as for a man. This law induced a free-thinking Muslim to ask if the hand is worth 500 dinars, this being the fine for depriving a man of that member, why should it be cut off for a quarter of a dinar? He was answered, an honest hand is of great value, but not so is the hand that hath stolen. Amputation for theft, however, is now seldom practiced. Beating or some other punishment is usually inflicted in its stead um, for the first, second, and third offense, and frequently death for the fourth. The Muslims observe two grand aids or festivals every year, 
The first of these is immediately follows Ramadan, the month of abstinence, and lasts three days. It is called the Minor Festival. The other, which is called the Great Festival, commences on the 10th of the Hijjah, the day when the pilgrims halting in their valley of Mina, um, on their return from Mount Arafat to Mecca, perform their sacrifice. The observance of this festival also continues three days or four. Early in the first morning, on each of these festivals, the Muslim is required to perform a lustration of his whole person, as on the mornings of Friday and on the first morning of the minor festival, he should break his fast with a few dates and some other light food, um, but on the great festival, he abstains from food until he has acquitted himself of the religious duties now to be mentioned. Soon after sunrise, on the first day of each festival, the men dressed in new or in their best clothes repair to the mosque or to a particular place appointed for their performance of the prayers of the Eid. Um, going thither, um, they, should be re they should repeat frequently, God is most great on the minor festival inaudibly and on the other loud. The congregation having assembled to repeat the prayers of two rakahs, after which the khatib recites a khutbah, i.e. an exhortation and a prayer. Um, on each of these festivals in the mosque or the place of prayer and in the street and at each other's houses, friends congratulate and embrace each other, generally paying visits for this purpose. And the great receive... Um, and the great receive visits from their dependents. Um, the young on these occasions kiss the right hands of the aged, and servants or dependents do the same to their masters or superiors, unless the latter be of high rank, in which they kiss the ends of the hanging sleeves or the shirt of the outer garment. Most of the shops are closed, excepting those at which eatables and sweet drinks are sold, um, but the streets um, are filled with people in their holiday clothes. On the minor festival, which, as it terminates an arduous fast, is celebrated with more rejoicing than the other, servants and other dependents receive presents of new articles of clothing from their masters or patrons, and the servant receives presents of small sums of money from his master's friends, whom, if they do not visit his master, he goes to congratulate, as well as from any former master to whom he often takes a plate full of cacks. These are sweet cakes or biscuits of an annular form um, composed of flour and butter with a little ajimiya, a thick paste consisting of butter, honey, a little flour, and some spices inside. They are, also, they are also often sent as presents on this occasion by other people. Another custom required of the faithful on this festival is the giving of alms. On the great festival, after the prayers of, that, of the congregation, everyone who can afford it performs with his own hand or by that of a deputy, a sacrifice of the ram, um, he goat, cow or buffalo, or she camel, part of the meat of which he eats, and part he gives to the poor or to his friends or dependents. The ram or goat should be at least one year old, the cow or buffalo two years, and the camel five years, and none should have considerable mutate, mutilation or infirmity. A cow or buffalo or a camel is a sufficient sacrifice for seven persons. The clothes which were put on new at a formal festival are generally worn on this occasion, and the presents which are given to servants and others are usually worn somewhat less. On each of the two festivals, it is also customary, especially with the women, to visit the tombs of relations. The, par the party generally takes with them a palm branch and place it broken in several pieces or merely its leaves upon the tomb or the monument or some, instead of this, place sweet basil or other flowers. They also usually provide themselves with sweet cakes, bread, dates, um, or some other kind of food to distribute to the poor. But their first duty on arriving at the tomb is to recite the Fatiha, the opening chapter of the Quran, or to employ a person to recite previously a longer chapter, generally the 36th Surah Yasin, or even the whole of the book. Sometimes the visitors recite the Fatiha, and after having hired a person to perform a longer recitation, go away before he commences. The women often stay all the days of the festivals in the cemeteries, either in tents or in houses of their own, erected there for their reception on these and other occasions. The tent of each party surrounds the tomb, which is the object of their visit. In the outskirts of the cemetery, swings and whirlwigs um, are set up, and storytellers, jugglers, and dancers amuse the populace. End of Arabian Society in the Middle Ages, Chapter 1, Religion, in Myths and Legends Around the World, Collection 13.
the giant of St. Michael's Mount in Myths and Legends Around the World, Collection 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Giant of St. Michael's Mount by Henry Wisham Lanier Many are the tales of King Arthur's valiant round table of knights, whose deeds have been sung almost more than those of the king himself. But from the day when, as a demoiseau of some fifteen years, men say, in the sixth century after Christ, Arthur was crowned as successor to Uther Pendragon, he was an example of chivalry to his whole court. Quote, he was a very virtuous knight, right worthy of praise, whose fame was much in the mouths of men. To the haughty he was proud, but tender and pitiful to the simple. He was a stout knight and a bold, a passing crafty captain, as indeed was but just, for skill and courage were his servants at need, and large of his giving. He was one of love's lovers a lover also of glory, and his famous deeds are right fit to be kept in remembrance. He ordained the courtesies of courts, and observed high state in very splendid fashion. So long as he lived and reigned, he stood head and shoulders above all princes of the earth, both for courtesy and prowess, as for valor and liberality. End quote. Having settled his own realm in peace and restored the kingdom to its ancient borders, he conquered Ireland, Norway, Denmark, and Flanders, and after a nine years' war added France to his dominions. To him, thus flushed with victory, came ambassadors from the Emperor of Rome, bidding him to appear at that city and make restitution for his wrongful attacks on the empire's provinces, or to expect to be hailed thither in bonds for judgment by the Senate. The king's answer was to summon a vast army, commit the realm to the care of his nephew Mordred, who afterward wrought such bail to that noble company, and set out over sea for Rome, not to carry tribute, but to seek it. A puissant and well-armed host it was that set forth, and the warrior monarch who led them was arrayed in harness that surpassed all his followers. His thigh-pieces were of steel, wrought strong and fairly by some cunning smith. His hauberk was stout and richly chased, even such a vesture as became so puissant a king. Upon him was girt his sword, Excalibur. Mighty was the glaive, and long in the blade. It was forged in the Isle of Avalon, and he who brandished it, naked in his hand, deemed himself a happy man. His helmet gleamed upon his head, the nasal was of gold, circlets of gold adorned the headpiece, with many a clear stone, and a dragon was fashioned for its crest. This helm had once been worn by Uther, his sire. The king was mounted upon a destrier, charger, passing fair, strong, and speedy, loving well the battle. About his neck was set his shield, all clean of elephant's bone, ivory, on which was painted in several colours the image of Our Lady of St. Mary. The lance he carried was named Ron. It was a strong shaft, tough and great, sharp at the head, and very welcome at need in the press of battle. It had been made in Carmarthen by a smith that hight Griffin, and King Uther had carried it before time. Setting out from Southampton with his great host, the king sailed for France, and though the mariners steering by the stars were very fearful of the dark, the ships came safely to haven very early in the morning at Barfleur in Normandy. 
They had been but a little while in the land when tidings were brought to the king that a marvelously strong giant newly come to that land had carried off Helen, the niece of his kinsman, Oil. This doleful lady, the giant, named Dinabuk, had taken to a high place known as St. Michael's Mount, though in that day there was neither church nor monastery on the cliff, but all was shut close by the waves of the sea. The adventure which followed was told many times in the old days by Wais, Laomon, and others. Let us listen to the unknown romancer of the fourteenth century who left us morte arturi. When they had reached the shore and raised their tents, a Templar came and informed the king, Here too is a tyrant that torments thy people, a great giant of Genoa, engendered by fiends. He hath devoured more than five hundred people, and also many infants and free-born children. This hath been his sustenance now for seven winters, and yet is the glutton not sated so well it pleaseth him. In the country of Cotentin, no people has he left outside the strong castle enclosed within walls, for he has completely destroyed all the children of the commons and carried them to his crag and devoured them there. The Duchess of Brittany he has taken to-day near Rennes, as she rode with her fair knights and led her to the mountain where he abideth. We followed far off more than five hundred barons and citizens and noble bachelors, but he reached the crag. She shrieked so loud, the horror of that creature I shall never forget. She was the flower of France, or of five realms, and one of the fairest that was ever formed, the gentlest jewel accounted by lords from Genoa to Guerin, by Jesus of heaven. She was thy wife's cousin, as thou mayest know, and sprung from the noblest race that reign in this earth. As thou art a righteous king, take pity on the people and endeavour to avenge them that are thus affronted. Alas, said the king, so long as I have lived, had I known of this it had been well, it has not happened fairly but fallen foul that this fiend hath destroyed the fair lady. I had liefer than all France this fifteen winters that I had been before that fellow a furlong away when he laid hold of that lady and led her to the mountains. I had left behind my life ere she had suffered harm. But can you tell me the crag where lives that man? I will go to that place and speak with him, to deal with that tyrant for treason to his lord, and make a truce for a time till it may happen better. Sire, see ye yon foreland with yonder two fires? There lurks that fiend. Ask when thou mayest upon the crest of the crag by a cold well that encloses the cliff within its clear stream. There wilt thou find dead folk without number, more florins of faith than in all the rest of France, and more treasure hath that traitor unlawfully got than there was in Troy, I trow, what time it was conquered. Then the noble king sighed for pity of those people, went right to a tent and rested no longer. He welters and wrestleth with himself, and wringeth his hands. There was no wight in the world that knew what he wanted. He called Sir Caius, that served with the cup, and Sir Bedivere, the bold, that bore his great brand. Look to it that after evensong ye be armed full well, and mounted on horses by yonder thicket, by yon blithe stream, for I will pass privately in pilgrimage that way at supper-time, when the lords are served to seek a saint by yon salt streams on St. Michael's Mount, where miracles are seen. After evensong, King Arthur himself went to his wardrobe and took out his clothes. He armed him in a jerkin with a rich golden fringe, and above that laid a jerin of acre right over, and above that a coat of gentle mail, a tunic of jerodin with edges frayed. He drew on a bassinet of burnished silver, the best that was in basil with rich borders, the crest and the crown enclosed so fair with clasps of bright gold, adorned with stones, the visor and the avantai, equipped so fair without a flaw, with eyelets of silver, his gauntlets gaily gilded and engraven at the borders with grains and balls of most glorious hue. He bore a broad shield and calls for his sword, he jumped on the brown steed and waits on the heath. 
He rises in his stirrups and stands aloft. He strains himself stoutly and looks forth. Then he spurs the bay steed and rides to the thicket, and there his knights await him, gallantly arrayed. They rode by that river that runneth so swift where the trees overstretch with fair boughs. The roe and the reindeer run recklessly there in thickets and rose gardens to feast themselves. The thickets were in blossom with mayflowers, with falcons and pheasants of fair hues. All the birds lived there which fly with wings, for there sang the cuckoo full loud on the bushes. With all birds of merriment they gladden themselves. The voice of the nightingale notes was sweet they strove with the throstles three hundred at once that this murmur of water and singing of birds might cure him of ill who never was whole then moved these folk quickly and alighted on foot and fastened their fair steeds afar off then the king sternly told his knights to abide with their horses and come no further for I will seek this saint by myself, and speak with this master man that guards this mountain, and then shall ye partake of the sacrament one after the other honorably at St. Michael's, full mighty with Christ. The king climbs the crag with cliffs full high, to the top of the crag he climbs aloft, lifts up his umbra and looks about him keenly, receiving the cold wind on his face to comfort him. Two fires he finds flaming full high, for a quarter of a furlong he thus walks between them. Along the way by the well he wanders on to get to know of the warlock where he abides. He moves to the port fire, and even there he finds a very woeful widow, wringing her hands and weeping with painful tears on a grave newly marked in the soil since midday, it seemed. He saluted her sorrowfully with becoming words, and straightway asked after the fiend. Then this woeful widow joylessly greets him, rose up on her knees and clasped her hands, saying, Unhappy man! Thou speakest too loudly. If yon warlock heareth, he will devour us both. Cursed be the white that directed thee thither, that made thee to travel here in these wild parts. I warn thee for thy honour, thou seekest sorrow. Whither hastenest thou, man? Thou seemest unhappy. Goest thou to slay him with thy bright sword? Wert thou whitier than Wade or Gawain, thou shouldst win no honour. I warn thee beforehand, thou crossest thyself unsafely to seek these mountains. Six such as thou are not sufficient to cope with him alone. For, an thou seest him alone, thy heart will fail thee to cross thyself safely. So huge he seemeth. Thou art noble and fair, and in the flower of thy manhood. But thou art doomed already by my fay, and that I foretell thee. Were there fifty such as thee in the field or on the fair earth, the monster with his fist would fell you all. Lo, here, the dear duchess to-day was she taken, deep buried in the ground. He murdered this mild lady, ere midday was wrung, without any mercy I wot not why. He slew her churlishly, and here have I embalmed her and buried her afterwards. For the grief of this incurable woe I shall never be happy again. Of all the friends she had, none followed after her but I, her foster mother of fifteen winters. To move from this foreland I shall never attempt, but shall be found in this field till I am left dead. Then answer Sir Arthur to that old wife, I am come from the conqueror courteous and noble, as one of the most noble of Arthur's knights, a messenger to this vile wretch for the benefit of the people, to speak with his master man that guards this mountain, to treat with this tyrant for the treasure of lands and to make truce, for time, till it may turn out better. Fie! Thy words are but wasted, quoth that wife then, for he sets but little by both lands and people. No rents of red gold he troubles, but he will break the law when he chooses himself, without the permission of any, as lord of his own. But he hath a mantle, which he keeps for himself, that was spun in Spain by special women, and afterwards adorned in Greece, full fairly. It is covered all over with hair, and embroidered with the beards of valiant kings, woven and combed, that knights may know each king by his colour, in his home where he abides. 
Here he seizes the revenues of fifteen kingdoms each Easter evening. However, it so happens that they send it themselves for the safety of the people at that season with certain knights, and he has asked Arthur all these seven winters. Therefore he herds here to outrageous people until the king of Britain has fed his lips and sent his beard to that bold monster with his best knights. Unless thou hast brought that beard, go thou no further, for it is bootless that thou shouldst stay for aught else, for he has more treasure to take when he likes than ever had Arthur or any of his forefathers. If thou hast brought the beard, he will be more pleased than if thou gavest him Burgundy or Britain. But take care for love's sake, that thou keep thy lips silent, so that no word escape from them whatever betides. See that thy present be ready, and trouble him but little, for he is at his supper, and will be easily angered. And now take my advice, and remove thy clothes, and kneel in thy mantle, and call him thy lord. He sups all this season on seven children of the commons, chopped up on a charger of pure white silver, with pickles, and finely ground spices and wines of Portugal mixed with honey. Three luckless damsels turn his spits. Ha! I have brought the beard, quoth he, for thus it pleaseth me, for then will I go and bear it myself. But pray, if thou wilt tell me where this monster abideth, I shall commend thee and I live, so help me our lord. Go straight to the fire, quoth she that flames so high, there lurks that fiend as thou wilt discover. But thou must go somewhat to the south, sidling a little, for his power of smelling extends over six miles. The source of the smoke he sought speedily, crossed himself safely with certain words, and going to the side he caught sight of the fiend, as she said, unseemly supping alone. He lay at full length, reposing foully, the thigh of a man's limb he lifted up by the haunch, his back and the lower parts and his broad loins he baked at the dreadful fire, and he was breechless. There were roasting full rudely dreadful meats of men and cattle bound together, a large pot crammed with anointed children, some spitted like birds, and women turned them. And then this comely king's heart was sorely grieved because of his people at the place where he stood. Then he girded on his shield and hesitates no longer. He brandishes his bright sword by its bright hilt, goes forth to the fiend with a rough determination, and loudly hails that giant with fierce words. Now may almighty God that ruleth us all give thee sorrow and trouble, thou glutton, that liest here for the foulest monster that was ever formed. Foully thou feedest thyself. The devil take thy soul. Here is unclean quarry, fellow by my troth, refuse of all creatures, thou cursed wretch, because thou hast killed anointed children, thou hast made martyrs, and taken away the lives of those who are broached here on spits in this place, and slaughtered by thy hand. I shall work thee thy punishment, as thou greatly deservest by the might of St. Michael who guardeth this mountain. And for this fair lady that thou hast left dead, gird thyself, thou son of a dog. The devil take thy soul, for thou shalt die to-day through the force of my arm. Then was the glutton dismayed, and glared unseemly, he grinned like a greyhound with grisly teeth. He gaped and groaned aloud with grievous gestures for wrath with the good king who spake to him in anger. His hair and his forelock were matted together and hung before his face for about half a foot. His brow and forehead were all like the skin of a frog and seemed freckled, hook-nosed like a hawk and a fierce bird, and hairy round his hollow eyes with overhanging brows, rough as a dog-fish, hardly could be seen, so was he hid in that mass of hair, ears he had full, huge, and ugly to see, with horrible eyes and burning withal, flat-mouthed like a flounder with grinning lips, and the flesh in his front teeth as foul as a bear. His beard was rough and black and reached to his breast, fat like a porpoise with a huge carcass, and flesh still hung in shreds from his foul lips. 
bull-necked was that giant and broad of shoulders with a streaked breast like a boar with long bristles, rough arms like oak branches with gnarled sides, limbs and loins right hateful to see. Believe ye in truth, shovel-footed was the man that he seemed to straddle, with unshapely hanks shuffling together, thick thighs like a giant and thicker in the haunch, fat as a hog, full terrible he looked, Whoever might reckon faithfully the full length of this man from the face to the foot, he was five fathoms long. Then he started up sturdily on two stiff shanks and soon caught up a club of bright iron. He would have killed the king with his keen weapon, but through the wisdom of Christ the carl failed. The crest and the coronal and the silver clasps cleanly with his club he crashed down to the earth. The king raises his shield and covers himself completely and with his fierce weapon reaches him a blow right full in the face he struck him, so that the burnished blade reached to his brains. He wiped his face with his foul hands and strikes fast at Arthur's face fiercely thereafter. The king changes his foot and withdraws a little. Had he not escaped that blow, he had fared evil. He follows up fiercely and strikes a blow high up on the haunch with his hard weapon, that half a foot of the weapon is hidden in the flesh. The monster's hot blood runs down the hilt. Even to the entrails he strikes the giant. Then he groaned, and he roared, and roughly strikes full eagerly at Arthur, and on the earth strikes a sword's length within the sword. He smites at once so that the king nearly swooned from the force of his blow. But yet the king nimbly and swiftly strives. He smites with the sword so that it gashed the giant's loins, and the blood gushes out so that it makes all the ground slimy on which he stands. Then he casts down his club and seizes the king. On the top of the crag he caught him in his arms and enfolds him securely to crush his ribs. So tightly holds he him that his heart is near to bursting. Then the doleful damsels fall down on the earth, kneeling and crying and wringing their hands. Christ, deliver yonder knight and keep him from grief, and never let that fiend take his life. Yet the warlock is so mighty that he crushes him under. Fiercely they wrung and wrestled together, they weltered and wallowed on those rushes, they tumble and turn about and tear their clothes roughly from the top, they tumble down together. Arthur sometimes on top and sometimes beneath, from the crest of the hill right down to the hard rock. They cease not until they reach the brink of the sea. But Arthur, with his dagger, smites the giant until it sinks right up to the hilt in him. The thief, in his death struggle, grasped him so fiercely that three ribs in the king's side were thrust asunder. Then Sir Caius the keen, moved in sorrow for the king, said, Alas, we are undone, my lord is overthrown. Fallen down with the fiend, it is all over. We must be forfeit and banished forever. They lift up his hauberk and feel beneath, his stern and his haunches too, right up to his shoulders, his flanks and his loins and his fair sides, both his back and his breast and his bright arms. They were glad when they found no flesh wounds, and for that they were joyed, these gentle knights. Now, Sert, says Sir Bevidere, it seemeth by my lord... He seeketh saints but seldom, wherefore he grips the tighter that thus seizes the saint's body out of these high cliffs, to carry forth such a man to clothe him in silver. By Michael, of such a fellow I have great wonder than ever our sovereign lord should suffer him in heaven. If all saints be such who serve our lord, I shall no saint be, ever, by my father's soul. Then laughs the bold king at Bevedere's words, This saint have I sought, so help me our lord. Wherefore draw out thy sword and pierce him to the heart. Make certain of this fellow. He hath angered me sorely. I have not fought with such a wight these fifteen winters, but in the mountains in Wales I met such another. He was the strongest by far than I ever met, and had not my fortune been favourable, dead would I be now. The other whom the king had in mind was Rayens, a Riton, a Welsh giant, who in his day made war on divers kings. Of these some were slain in battle, and others remained captive in his hand. Alive or dead, Hyance used them despitefully, for it was his wont to shave the beards of these kings and purple therewith a cloak of furs that he wore, very rich. Vainglorious beyond measure was Hyance of his embroidered cloak. 
Now by reason of folly and lightness, Rayon sent messages to Arthur, bidding him shave his beard and send it forth to the giant in all good will. Since Arthur was a mightier lord and a more virtuous prince than his fellows, Rayons made covenant to prefer his beard before theirs, and hold it in honour as the most silken fringe of his mantle. Should Arthur refuse to grant Rayons the trophy, then naught was there to do but that body to body they must fight out their quarrel in single combat alone. He who might slay his adversary or force him to own himself vanquished should have the beard for his guerdon together with the mantle of furs fringes and garniture and all an old ballad describes the scene at camelot when this impudent message arrived as it fell out on a pentecost day king arthur at camelot kept his court royal with his fair queen dame guinevere the gay and many bold barons sitting in hall with ladies attired in purple and pall and heralds in hooks hooting on high, cried, Largesse, largesse, chevalier très hardi. A doughty dwarf to the uppermost dees, right pertly, gan pricke, kneeling on knee, with Stephen full stout and miss all the prees, said, Now, Sir King Arthur, God save thee and see, Sir Rayans of North Gales greeteth well thee and bids thee thy beard anon to him send, or else from thy jaws he will it off rend. For his robe of state is a rich scarlet mantle, with eleven kings' beards bordered about, and there is room left yet in a cantle for thine to stand, to make the twelfth out. This must be done, be thou never so stout, this must be done. I tell thee no fable, Maugre the teeth of all thy round table. When this mortal message from his mouth passed, great was the noise both in hall and in bower. The king fumed, the queen screeched, ladies were aghast, princes puffed, barons blustered, lords began lower. Knights stormed, squires startled, like steed in a stour. Pages and yeomen yelled out in the hall. Then in came Sir Kay, the king's seneschal. Silence! My sovereigns, quoth this courteous knight, and in that stound the stour began still. Then the dwarf's dinner full dearly was dight, of wine and wassail he had his will, and when he had eaten and drunken his fill, an hundred pieces of fine coined gold were given this dwarf for his message bold. But say to Sir Rance, thou dwarf, quoth the king, that for his bold message I do him defy and shortly with basins and pans will him ring out of North Gales, where he and I with swords and not razors quickly shall try whether he or King Arthur will prove the best barber, and therewith he shook his good sword Escalibur. King Arthur met this upstart in battle on a high mountain, and there the king slew Ryance with the sword, spoiling him of that rich garment of furs with its border of dead men's beards. And now, as he looked down at the loathly dinner book, he realized that he had conquered a monster more loathly and misshapen, a giant more horrible, bigger and mightier than was Réans, even in the prime of his youth and strength. When he had thought upon these things, the king said to his comrades, Anon! Strike off his head and put it on a stake. Give it to thy squire, for he is well mounted. Bear it to Sir Howell, that is in sore straits, and bid him take heart, for his enemy is destroyed. Then bear it to Barfleur, and fasten it on iron, and set it on the barbican for men to see. My sword and my broad shield lie upon the moor, on the crest of the crag where we first fought. And the club, thereby all of bright iron that hath killed many a Christian in the land of Cotentin. Go to the foreland and fetch me that weapon, and let us go back to our fleet where it lays in the water. If thou wilt have any treasure, take whatever thou likest. I will have the mantle and the club. I covet naught else. Now they go to the crag, these comely knights, and brought him the broad shield and his bright weapon, the club and the cloak too. Sir Caius himself goes with the conqueror to show the kings whom the king had with him in secret, while bright day climbed up above through the clouds. 
By that time a great noise was there at the court, and in front of the comely king they kneeled all together. Welcome, our liege lord, too long hast thou fought, our governor under God, ablest and most noble, to whom grace is granted and given at his will. Now thy happy arrival hath comforted us all, thou hast in thy royalty revenged thy people. Through help of thy hand thine enemy is destroyed that overcame thy people and reft them of their children. Never was their kingdom so readily relieved of its troubles. Then the conqueror speaks Christian-like to his people. Thank ye God, quoth he, for his grace, and no man, for man's deed it never was but his own might, or a miracle of his mother's, who is so mild to all. He called then the boatmen sharply at once to hasten with the shoremen to shift the goods. All that great treasure which the traitor won, see it be given to the commons, clergy, and others of the country. See it be dealt out to my dear people, so that none may complain under penalty of your lives. He ordered his cousin with knightly words to build a church on the rock where the body lay, and a convent therein for service to Christ, in memory of that martyr who rests in the mountain. And that beautiful pinnacled church, thrusting up from the island's rocky cliffs toward the sky, you may see at this very day. End of the Giant of St. Michael's Mount in Myths and Legends Around the World Collection 13 Read by Sandra The First Day of 2022The Wanderings of Freya, for Myths and Legends Around the World, Collection 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sandra, near Montreal, 2022. From the Heroes of Asgard, by A. and E. Curie, 1904. Part 1. The Necklace Brisingamon Now, though Frey was made king and schoolmaster of the Light Elves, and spent the greater part of his time with them in Alfheim, his sister, Freya, remained in the city of Asgard, and had a palace built for her named Folkvang. In this palace there was one very beautiful hall, Sesrimnir, the roomy seated, where Freya entertained her guests and she had always plenty of them, for everyone liked to look at her beautiful face and listen to her enchanting music, which was quite superior to anybody else's. She had, moreover, a wonderful husband named Odur, who was one of the sons of the immortals, and had come from a long way off on purpose to marry her. Freya was a little proud of this, and used often to speak of it to Frigga and the other ladies of Asgard. Some of them said she was a very fortunate person, but some were a little jealous of her, whilst Frigga always gravely warned her not to be vain on account of her happiness, lest sorrow should overtake her unawares. Everything went on quite smoothly, however, for a long time, Freya leading a very gay and beautiful life in the sunshine of her happiness, and herself a very radiant joy to everyone around her. But one day, one unlucky day, Freya, this fair and sunshiny young Vanna, went out alone from Asgard to take a walk in Alfheim. She hoped to meet somewhere, thereabouts, her dear brother Frey, whom she'd not seen for a long time and of whom she wanted to ask a very particular favour. The occasion for it was this. Heimdall and Aegir were expected to dine at Valhalla the next day, and Freya and her husband were invited to meet them. All the lords and ladies of Asgard were to be there. Njord, too, was coming with his new wife, Skadi, the daughter of a giant. Everyone will be beautifully dressed, said Freya, and I have not a single ornament to wear. But you are more beautiful than anyone, Freya, said her husband, for you were born in the spacious wind home. All are not so high-minded as you, Odur, answered his wife and if I go to Valhalla without an ornament of any kind, I shall certainly be looked down upon. So saying, Freya set off, as I told you, to Alfheim, determined to ask of her good-natured brother a garland of flowers at least. 
but somehow or other she could not find Frey anywhere. She tried to keep in Elfheim. She thought she was there. But all the time she was thinking of her dress and her ornaments, planning what she should wear, and her steps went downward, downward away from Elfheim to the cavern of four dwarfs. Where am I? said Freya to herself as she at last lost the light of day, and went down wandering on deeper and deeper between the high walls and under the firm roof of rock. Why, surely this must be Svartheim, and yet it is not unpleasant, nor quite dark here, though the sun is not shining. And in truth it was not dark, for far on before her, winding in and out through the cavern's innermost recesses, were groups of little men who had each a lantern in his cap and a pickaxe in his hand, and they were working hard, digging for diamonds, which they piled up the walls and hung across the roof in white and rose-coloured coronets, marvellously glittering. Four clever little dwarf chiefs were there directing the labours of the rest, but as soon as they caught sight of Freya, they sat down in the centre of the cavern and began to work diligently at something which they held between them, bending over it with strange chattering and grimaces. Freya felt very curious to see what it was, but her eyes were so dazzled with the blaze of diamonds and lanterns that she was obliged to go nearer in order to distinguish it clearly. Accordingly, she walked on to where the four dwarfs were sitting and peeped over their shoulders. Oh. Brilliant, exquisitely worked, bewildering. Freya drew back again with almost blinded eyes, for she had looked upon the necklace Brisingamon, and at the same moment a passionate wish burst forth in her heart to have it for her own, to wear it in Valhalla, to wear it always round her own fair neck. Life to me, said Freya, is no longer worth having without bristing garment. Then the dwarfs held it out to her, but also looked cunningly at one another as they did so, and burst into a laugh so loud that it rang through the vaulted caverns, echoed and echoed back again from side to side, from dwarf to dwarf, from depth to depth. Freya, however, only turned her head a little on one side, stretched out her hand, grasped the necklace with her small fingers, and then ran out of the cavern as quickly as ever she could, up again to the green hillside. There she sat down and fitted the brilliant ornament about her neck, after which she looked a little shyly at the reflection of herself in a still pool that was near, and turned homewards with an exulting heart. She felt certain that all was well with her. Nevertheless, all was not well, but very miserable indeed. When Freya was come back to Asgard again and to her palace of Folkvang, she sought her own private apartments that she might see Odur alone and make him admire her necklace, Brisingamen. But Odur was not there. She searched in every room, hither and thither. But alas, he was not to be found in any room or any hall in all the palace of Folkvang. Freya searched for him in every place. She walked restlessly about, in and out among the places of the room he seated. She peered wistfully with sad eyes in the face of every guest, but the only face she cared to see she never saw. Odur was gone, gone back forever to the home of the immortals. Brisingamen and Odur could not live together in the palace of Folkvang, but Freya did not know this. She did not know why Odur was gone, nor where he was gone. She only saw that he was not there, and she wrung her hands sadly, and watered her jewels with salt, warm tears. As she sat thus and mourned in the entrance of her palace, all the ladies of Asgard passed by on their way to Valhalla and looked at her. Some said one thing, some another, but no one said anything at all encouraging, or much to the purpose. Frigga passed by last of all, and she raised her head with a little severe shake, saying something about beauty and pride and punishment which sank down so deeply into the heart of the sorrow-stricken young Vanna that she got up with a desolate resolution and, presenting herself before the throne of Asa Odin, spoke to him thus, Father of Aesir, listen to my weeping and do not turn away from me with a cruel frown. 
I have searched through my palace of Fokvang and all through the city of Asgard, but nowhere is Odur the immortal to be found. Let me go, Father Odin, I beseech you, and seek him far and near, across the earth, through the air, over the sea, even to the borders of Jotunheim. And Odin answered, Go, Freya, and good fortune go with you. Then Freya sprang into her swift, softly rolling chariot, which was drawn by two cats, waved her hand as she rose over the city, and was gone. Part 2 Loki the iron wood, a boundless waste. The cats champed their bright bits and skimmed alike over earth and air with swift clinging steps, eager and noiseless. The chariot rolled on and Freya was carried away up and down into every part of the world, weeping golden tears wherever she went. They fell down from her pale cheeks and rippled away behind her in little sunshiny rivers that carried beauty and weeping to every land. She came to the greatest city in the world and drove down its wide streets. But none of the houses here are good enough for Odur, said Freya to herself. I will not ask for him at such doors as these. So she went straight on to the palace of the king. Is Odur in this palace? she asked of the gatekeeper. Is Odur the immortal living with the king? But the gatekeeper shook his head and assured her that his master had never even heard of such a person. Then Freya turned away and knocked at many other stately doors asking for Odur, but no one in all that great city so much as knew her husband's name. Then Freya went into the long, narrow lanes and shabby streets where the poor people lived, but there it was all the same. Everyone said only, no, not here, and stared at her. In the night time, Freya went quite away from the city and the lanes and the cottages, far off to the side of a lake, where she lay down and looked over into the water. By and by the moon came and looked there too, and the queen of night saw a calm face in the water, serene and high, but the queen of beauty saw a troubled face, frail and fair. Brisingamen was reflected in the water too, and its rare colours flashed from the little waves. Freya was pleased at the sight of her favourite ornament, and smiled even in the midst of her tears. But as for the moon, instead of Brisingamen, the deep sky and the stars were around her. At last Freya slept by the side of the lake, and then a dark shade crept up the bank on which she was lying, sat down beside her, and took her fair head between its hands. It was Loki, and he began to whisper into Freya's ear as she slept. You were quite right, Freya, he said, to go out and try to get something for yourself in Svartheim, instead of staying at home with your husband. It was very wise of you to care more for your dress and your beauty than for Odur. You went down into Svartheim and found Brisingamen. Then the immortal went away. But is not Brisingamen better than he? Why do you cry, Freya? Why do you start so? Freya turned, moaning, and tried to lift her head from between his hands, but she could not, and it seemed in her dream as if a terrible nightmare brooded over her. Brisingamen is dragging me down, she cried in her sleep, and laid her little hand upon the clasp, without knowing what she was doing. Then a great laugh burst forth in Svartheim and came shuddering up through the vaulted caverns until it shook the ground upon which she lay. Loki started up and was gone before Freya had time to open her eyes. It was morning, and the young Vanna prepared to set out on her journey. Brisingamen is fair, she said as she bade farewell to her image in the lake. Brisingamen is fair, but I find it heavy sometimes. After this, Freya went to many cities and towns and villages, asking everywhere for Odur. But there was not one in all the world who could tell her where he was gone, and at last her chariot rolled eastward and northward to the very borders of Jotunheim. There Freya stopped, for before her lay Janvid, the iron wood, which was one road from earth to the abode of the giants, and whose tall trees, black and hard, were trying to pull down the sky with their iron claws. In the entrance sat an iron witch, with her back to the forest and her face towards the vanna. 
Yarnvit was full of the sons and daughters of this iron witch. They were wolves and bears and foxes and many-headed ravenous birds. Eastward, croaked a raven as Freya drew near. Eastward in the iron wood the old one sitteth. And there she did sit, talking in quarrelsome tones to her wolf sons and vulture daughters, who answered from the wood behind her, howling, screeching and screaming all at the same time. There was a horrible din, and Freya began to fear that her low voice would never be heard. She was obliged to get out of her chariot and walk close up to the old witch, so that she might whisper in her ear. "'Can you tell me, old mother,' she said, "'where Odor is? Have you seen him pass this way?' "'I don't understand one word of what you're saying,' answered the iron woman, "'and if I did, I have no time to waste in answering foolish questions.' Now the witch's words struck like daggers into Freya's heart, and she was not strong enough to pull them out again, so she stood there a long time, not knowing what she should do. You had better go, said the crone to her at last. There's no use in standing there, crying, for this was the grandmother of strong-minded women, and she hated tears. Then Freya got into her chariot again and went westward a long way to the wide, boundless land where impenetrable forests were growing and undying nature reigned in silence. She knew that the silent Vidar was living there, for not finding any pleasure in the gay society of Asgard, he had obtained permission from Father Odin to retire to this place. He's one of the Aesir, and perhaps he will be able to help me, said the sad-hearted young Vanna, as her chariot rolled on through empty moorlands and forests, always in twilight. Her ear heard no sound, her eye saw no living shape, but still she went on with a trembling hope till she came to the spot, begrown with branches and high grass, which was Vidar's dwelling. Vidor was sitting there, firm as an oak, and as silent as night. Long grass grew up through his long hair, and the branches of trees crossed each other over his eyes. His ears were covered with moss, and dew drops glistened upon his beard. It is almost impossible to get to him, sighed Freya, through all these wet leaves, and I am afraid that his moss-covered ears are very deaf, but she threw herself down on the ground before him and said, Tell me, Vidar, does Odir hide among thick trees, or is he wandering over the broad west lands? Vidar did not answer her, only a pale gleam shot over his face, as if reflected from that of Freya, like sunshine breaking through a wood. He does not hear me, said Freya to herself, and she crushed nearer to him through the branches. Only tell me, Vidar, she said. Is Odur here? But Vidar said nothing, for he had no voice. Then Freya hid her face in her lap and wept bitterly for a long time. An Asa, she said at last, looking up, is no better to one than an iron witch when one is really in trouble. And then she gathered her disordered dress about her, threw back her long bright hair, and springing into her chariot, once again went wearily on her way. Part 3. The King of the Sea and His Daughters At last she came to the wide sea coast, and there everything was gloriously beautiful. It was evening, and the western sky looked like a broad crimson flower. No wind stirred the ocean, but the small waves rippled in rose-coloured froth on the shore, like the smiles of a giant at play. Aegir, the old sea king, supported himself on the sand whilst the cool waters were laving his breast and his ears drank their sweet murmur. For nine waves were his beautiful daughters and they and their father were talking together. Now, though Aegir looked so stormy and old, he was really as gentle as a child and no mischief would ever have happened in his kingdom if he'd been left to himself. But he had a cruel wife called Ran, 
who was the daughter of a giant and so eagerly fond of fishing that whenever any of the rough winds came to call upon her husband, she used to steal out of the deep sea caves where she lived and follow ships for miles under the water, dragging her net after her so that she might catch anyone who fell overboard. Freya wandered along the shore towards the place where the sea king was lying, and as she went she heard him speaking to his daughters. What is the history of Freya? he asked, and the first wave answered. Freya is a fair young Vana, who once was happy in Asgard. Then the second wave said, But she left her fair palace there, and Odur, her immortal love. Third wave, she went down to the cavern of dwarves. Fourth wave, she found Brisingamen there and carried it away with her. Fifth wave, but when she got back to Folkvang, she found that Odur was gone. Sixth wave, because the Vanna had loved herself more than immortal love. Seventh wave, Freya will never be happy again, for Odur will never come back. Eighth wave, Odir will never come back as long as the world shall last. Ninth wave, Odur will never return, nor Freya forget to weep. Freya stood still, spellbound, listening, and when she heard the last words, that Odur would never come back, she wrung her hands and cried, Oh, Father Aegir, trouble comes! comes surging up from a wide sea, wave over wave into my soul. And in truth it seemed as if her words had power to change the whole surface of the ocean. Wave over wave rose higher and spoke louder. Run was seen, dragging her net in the distance. Old Aegir shouted and dashed into the deep. Sea and sky mixed in confusion and night fell upon the storm. Then Freya sank down exhausted on the sand where she lay until her kind daughter, the sleepy little Siofna, came and carried her home again in her arms. After this, the beautiful Vanna lived in her palace of Fokvang, with friends and sisters, Aesir and Asinur. But Odur did not return, nor Freya forget to weep. Freya, as she appears in the Edda, was the goddess of the beautiful year and of all sorts of love, the story of her marriage with Odur is extremely obscure. It is even thought that Odur is only a form of Odin, and in like manner that Freya and Frigga are very intimately connected. Frigga was the patroness of married love, of the happiness and duties of the home. Originally she and Freya and all the great goddesses were probably personifications of the earth. But Freya, as goddess of love, is less developed in idea than Frigga, she has more of the nature goddess, less of the woman in her. She was said to divide the spoil with Odin in battle, taking half the slain for herself and leaving him the other half, which points to her having been at one time his wife and sharing all with him. Supposing her to have been the beautiful year, or rather the earth during the beautiful part of the year, Odur leaving her would imply the beginning of the shortening of days at midsummer. The source of summer flies... Summer seeks him weeping golden tears. Do these mean autumn's golden leaves and falling fruits, or that the sun's beautiful gifts must ever follow him? This myth of summer's source, the sun, declining from the year, has, it is supposed, been given to Odur because it was not important enough to belong to the greatest of the gods, although it was really wrapped up in his nature, and the names Odur and Odin are identical in German. Simrock says, quote, Every mythology tells us of the death of the beautiful part of the year, like the flight of a god who is mourned by his wife or his beloved. End quote. Looked at from this point of view, we see the summerly earth vaunting and decking herself with her richest jewels in the deepest pride of her delight at the very moment when the spirit of her existence is stealing away from her. The summer-decked earth without the sun of her life is soulless, has become mortal. But it must be confessed that the Edda is very obscure about Brisingamen and does not mention the necklace in connection with Odur's departure. 
The Iron Witch was the mother of two wolves who devoured the sun and the moon at Ragnarok. She is not mentioned in the myth of Freya, but in another lay. It has been suggested that Freya's tears may be due, and she, in the character of Aurora, when she sheds them, weeping for some star god of the night. End of the Wanderings of Freya For Myths and Legends Around the World Collection 13Frey, in Myths and Legends Around the World, Collection 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Frey, by A. and E. Keery, 1904. Part 1. On Tiptoe in Air Throne I told you some time ago how Van Frey went away into Alfheim with the Light Elves, of whom Odin made him king and schoolmaster. You've heard what Frey was like, and the kind of lessons he promised to teach his pupils, so you can imagine what pleasant times they had of it in Alfheim. Wherever Frey came, there was summer and sunshine. Flowers sprang up under his footsteps, and bright-winged insects like flying flowers hovered round his head. His warm breath ripened the fruit on the trees and gave a bright yellow color to the corn and purple bloom to the grapes as he passed through the fields and vineyards. When he rode along in his car, drawn by the stately boar, golden bristles, soft winds blew before him, filling the air with fragrance and spreading abroad the news, Van Frey is coming! and every half-closed flower burst into perfect beauty, and forest and field and hill flushed their richest colors to meet his presence. Under Frey's care and instruction, the pretty little light elves forgot their idle ways and learned all the pleasant tasks he had promised to teach them. It was the prettiest possible sight to see them in the evening, filling their tiny buckets and running about among the woods and meadows to hang the dewdrops deftly on the slender tips of the grass blades, or to drop them into the half-closed cups of the sleepy flowers. When this last of their day's tasks was over, they used to cluster round their summer king, like bees about the queen, while he told them stories about the wars between the Aesir and the giants or of the old time when he lived alone with his father Njord in Noatun, and listened to the waves singing songs of far distant lands. So pleasantly did they spend their time in Alfheim. But in the midst of all this work and play, Frey had a wish in his mind of which he could not help often talking to his clear-minded messenger and friend, Skirnir. I have seen many things, he used to say, and travelled through many lands, but to see all the world at once, as Asa Odin does from Air Throne, that must be a splendid sight. Only Father Odin may sit on Air Throne, Skirnir would say, and it seemed to Frey that this answer was not so much to the purpose as his friend's sayings generally were. At length, one very clear summer evening, when Odin was feasting with the other Aesir in Valhalla, Frey could restrain his curiosity no longer. He left Elfheim, where all the little elves were fast asleep, and without asking anyone's advice, climbed into Air Throne, and stood on tiptoe in Odin's very seat. It was a clear evening, and I had perhaps better not even try to tell you what Frey saw. He looked first all round him over Mannheim, where the rosy light of the set sun still lingered, and where men and birds and flowers were gathering themselves up for their night's repose. Then he glanced towards the heavenly hills where Bifrost rested, and then towards the shadowy land which deepened down into Niflheim. At length he turned his eyes northward to the misty land of Jotunheim, there the shades of evening had already fallen, but from his high place Frey could still see distinct shapes moving about through the gloom. Strange and monstrous shapes they were, and Frey stood a little higher on tiptoe that he might look further after them. 
In this position he could just descry a tall house standing on a hill in the very middle of Jutenheim. While he looked at it, a maiden came and lifted up her arms to undo the latch of the door. It was dusk in Jutenheim, but when this maiden lifted up her white arms, such a dazzling reflection came from them that Jutenheim and the sky and all the sea were flooded with clear light. For a moment everything could be distinctly seen, but Frey saw nothing but the face of the maiden with the uplifted arms, and when she had entered the house and shut the door after her, and darkness fell again on earth and sky and sea, darkness fell too upon Frey's heart. Part 2. The Gift The next morning, when the little elves woke up with the dawn, and came thronging round their king to receive his commands, they were surprised to see that he had changed since they last saw him. He's grown up in the night they whispered to one another sorrowfully, and in truth he was no longer so fit a teacher and playfellow for the merry little people as he'd been a few hours before. It was to no purpose that the sweet winds blew and the flowers opened when Frey came forth from his chamber. A bright white light still danced before him, and nothing now seemed to him worth looking at. That evening, when the sun had set and work was over, there were no stories for the light elves. Be still, Frey said, when they pressed round. If you will be still and listen, there are stories enough to be heard better than mine. I do not know whether the elves heard anything, but to Frey it seemed that flowers and birds and winds and the whispering rivers united that day in singing one song which he never wearied of hearing. We are fair, they said, but there is nothing in the whole world so fair as Gerda. "'the giant maiden whom you saw last night in Jotunheim. "'Frey has dewdrops in his eyes,' the little elves said to each other in whispers, "'as they sat round looking up at him, and they felt very much surprised, "'for only to men and the Aesir is it permitted to be sorrowful and weep. "'Soon, however, wiser people noticed the change that had come over the summer king.' and his good-natured father, Niard, set Skilnir one day into Alfheim to inquire into the cause of Frey's sorrow. He found him walking alone in a shady place, and Frey was glad enough to tell his trouble to his wise friend. When he had related the whole story, he said, And now you will see that there is no use in asking me to be merry as I used to be, for how can I ever be happy in Alfheim and enjoy the summer and sunshine while my dear Gert whom I love, is living in a dark, cold land among cruel giants. If she be really as beautiful and beloved as you say, answered Skirnir, she must be sadly out of place in Jutnheim. Why do you not ask her to be your wife and live with you in Elfheim? That I would only too gladly do, answered Frey. But if I were to leave Elfheim only for a few hours, the cruel giant Reim, the frost giant, would rush in to take my place. All the labors of the year would be undone in a night, and the poor toiling men who are watching for the harvest would wake some morning to find their cornfields and orchards buried in snow. Well, said Skirnir, thoughtfully, I am neither so strong nor so beautiful as you, Frey, but if you will give me the sword that hangs by your side... I will undertake the journey to Jutenheim, and I will speak in such a way of you and of Alfheim to the lovely Gert that she will gladly leave her land and the house of her giant father to come to you. Now Frey's sword was a gift, and he knew well enough that he ought not to part with it, or trust it in any hands but his own. And yet how could he expect Skirnir to risk all the dangers of Jutenheim for any less recompense than an enchanted sword? And what other hope had he of ever seeing his dear Goethe again? He did not allow himself a moment to think of the choice he was making. He unbuckled his sword from his side and put it into Skirnir's hands, and then he turned rather pettishly away and threw himself down on a mossy bank under a tree. You will be many days in travelling to Jutenheim, he said, and all the time I shall be miserable. Skirnir was too sensible to think this speech worth answering. He took a hasty farewell of Frey and prepared to set off on his journey. 
but before he left the hill he chanced to see the reflection of Frey's face in a little pool of water that lay near. In spite of its sorrowful expression, it was as beautiful as the woods are in full summer, and a clever thought came into Skirnir's mind. He stooped down, without Frey seeing him, and with cunning touch stole the picture out of the water. Then he fastened it up carefully in his silver drinking horn, and hiding it in his mantle, he mounted his horse and rode towards Jutnheim, secure of succeeding in his mission, since he carried a matchless sword to conquer the giant, and a matchless picture to win the maiden. Part 3 Fairest Gert I told you that the house of Dimir, Gerda's father, stood in the middle of Jotunheim, so it will not be difficult for you to imagine what a toilsome and wondrous journey Skirnir had. He was a brave hero, and he rode a brave horse, but when they came to the barrier of murky flame that surrounds Jotunheim, a shudder came over both. Dark it is without, said Skirnir to his horse and you and I must leap through flame and go over whore mountains among giant folk. The giants will take us both, or we shall return victorious together. Then he patted his horse's neck and touched him with his armed heel, and with one bound he cleared the barrier and his hoofs rang on the frozen land. Their first day's journey was through the land of the frost giants, whose prickly touch kills and whose breath is sharper than swords. Then they passed through the dwellings of the horse-headed and vulture-headed giants, monsters terrible to see. Skirnir hid his face and the horse flew along swifter than the wind. On the evening of the third day they reached Gimir's house. Skirnir rode around nine times. Though there were twenty doors, he could find no entrance, for fierce three-headed dogs guarded every doorway. At length he saw a herdsman pass near, and he rode up and asked him how it was possible for a stranger to enter Gimir's house or get a sight of his fair daughter, Gert. "'Are you doomed to death, or are you already a dead man?' answered the herdsman that you talk of seeing Gimir's fair daughter, or entering a house from which no one ever returns. My death is fixed for one day, said Skirmir in answer, and his voice, the voice of an Asa, sounded loud and clear through the misty air of Jotunheim. It reached the ears of the fair Gert as she sat in her chamber with her maidens. What is that noise of noises, she said, that I hear? The earth shakes with it, and all Gimir's halls tremble. Then one of the maidens got up and peeped out of the window. I see a man, she said. He has dismounted from his horse, and he's fearlessly letting it graze before the door. Go out and bring him in stealthily, then, said Gerda. I must again hear him speak, for his voice is sweeter than the ringing of bells. So the maiden rose and opened the house door softly, lest the grim giant, Gimir, who was drinking mead in the banquet hall with seven other giants, should hear and come forth. Skirnir heard the door open, and understanding the maiden's sign, he entered with stealthy steps and followed her to Gerda's chamber. As soon as he entered the doorway, the light from her face shone upon him, and he no longer wondered that Frey had given up his sword. Are you the son of an Asa, or an Alf, or of a wise van? asked Gerda. And why have you come through flame and snow to visit our halls? Then Skirnir came forward and knelt at Gerda's feet, and gave his message and spoke as he had promised to speak, of Van Frey and of Alfheim. Gerda listened, and it was pleasant enough to talk to her looking into her bright face, but she did not seem to understand much of what he said. He promised to give her eleven golden apples from Iduna's grove if she would go with him, and that she should have the magic ring Draupnir from which every day a still fairer jewel fell. But he found there was no use in talking of beautiful things to one who had never in all her life seen anything beautiful. Gerda smiled at him as a child smiles at a fairy tale. At length he grew angry. If you are so childish, maiden, 
he said, that you can believe only what you have seen and have no thought of Aesir land or the Aesir, then sorrow and utter darkness shall fall upon you. You shall live alone on the Eagle Mount turned towards hell. Terrors shall beset you. Weeping shall be your lot. Men and Aesir will hate you, and you shall be doomed to live forever with the frost giant, Rhyme, in whose cold arms you will wither away like a thistle on a housetop. Gently, said Gert, turning away her bright head and sighing. How am I to blame? You make such a talk of your Aesir and your Aesir. But how can I know about it, when all my life long I've lived with giants? At these words, Skirnir rose as if he would have departed, but Gerda called him back. You must drink a cup of mead, she said, in return for your sweet-sounding words. Skirnir heard this gladly, for now he knew what he would do. He took the cup from her hand, drank off the mead, and before he returned it, he contrived cleverly to pour in the water from his drinking horn, on which Frey's image was painted. Then he put the cup into Goethe's hand and bade her look. She smiled as she looked, and the longer she looked, the sweeter grew her smile, for she looked for the first time on a face that loved her, and many things became clear to her that she had never understood before. Skirnir's words were no longer like fairy tales. She could now believe in Aesir land and in all beautiful things. Go back to your master, she said at last, and tell him that in nine days I will meet him in the warm wood Barry. After hearing these joyful words, Skirnir made haste to take leave, for every moment that he lingered in the giant's house he was in danger. One of Goethe's maidens conducted him to the door, and he mounted his horse again and rode from Juttenheim with a glad heart. Part 4 The Wood Barry When Skirnir got back to Alfheim and told Gerd's answer to Frey, he was disappointed to find that his master did not immediately look as bright and happy as he'd expected. Nine days, he said, but how can I wait nine days? One day is long, and three days are very long, but nine days might as well be a whole year. I have heard children say such things when one tells them to wait for a new toy. Skirnir and old Niort only laughed at it, but Freya, and all the ladies of Asgard made a journey to Alfheim when they heard the story to comfort Frey and hear all the news about the wedding. Dear Frey, they said, it will never do to lie still here, sighing under a tree. You're quite mistaken about the time being long. It's hardly long enough to prepare the marriage presents and talk over the wedding. You have no idea how busy we're going to be. Everything in Alfheim will have to be altered a little. At these words, Frey really did lift up his head and wake up from his musings. He looked, in truth, a little frightened at the thought. But when all the Asgard ladies were ready to work for his wedding, how could he make any objection? He was not allowed to have much share in the business himself, but he had little time during the nine days to indulge in private thought for never before was there such a commotion in Alfheim. The ladies found so many things that wanted overlooking, and the little light elves were not of the slightest use to anyone. They forgot all their usual tasks and went running about through groves and fields and by the sedgy banks of rivers, peering into earth holes and creeping down into flower cups and empty snail shells, every one hoping to find a gift for Gerda. Some stole the light from glow-worms' tails and wove it into a necklace, and others pulled the ruby spots from cowslip leaves to set with jewels the acorn cups that Gerda was to drink from, while the swiftest runners chased the butterflies and pulled feathers from their wings to make fans and bonnet plumes. All the work was scarcely finished when the ninth day came and Frey set out from Alfheim with all his elves to the warm wood Barry. The Aesir joined him on the way, and they made, together, something like a wedding procession. First came Frey in his chariot, drawn by golden bristles, and carrying in his hand the wedding ring which was none other than Draupnir. 
the magic ring of which so many stories are told. Odin and Frigga followed with their wedding gift the ship Skidbladnir, in which all the Aesir could sit and sail, though it could afterwards be folded up so small that you might carry it in your hand. Then came Iduna, with eleven golden apples in a basket on her fair head, and then two and two all the heroes and ladies with their gifts. All round them flocked the elves, toiling under the weight of their offerings. It took twenty little people to carry one gift, and yet there was not one so large as a baby's finger. Laughing and singing and dancing they entered the warm wood, and every summer flower sent a sweet breath after them. Everything on earth smiled on the wedding day of Frey and Gerda, only when it was all over and everyone had gone home and the moon shone cold into the wood, it seemed as if the Vanir spoke to one another. Odin, said one voice, gave his eye for wisdom, and we have seen that it was well done. Frey, answered the other, has given his sword for happiness. It may be well to be unarmed while the sun shines and the bright days last, but when Ragnarok has come and the sons of Muspel ride down to the last fight, will not Frey regret his sword? Frey appears as the summer god, and the boar was sacred to him because from its tearing up the earth with its tusks it typified the agriculture and return of the seed-sowing time. Gerda is supposed to represent the frozen earth which summer seeing from far off loves and woos to his embrace. The lighting of the sky by the uplifted giant maiden's arms is explained to mean the northern lights glancing from one end of heaven to the other. Frey parts with his sword in order to win Gerda. This is alluded to in both Eddas as if it were wrong or at any rate highly imprudent. When the sons of Muspel come at Ragnarok, it is said, and Frey shall have to meet Surtur in battle, then wilt thou, unhappy, not have wherewith to fight. The ship Skidbladnir was said to have been made by four dwarfs in the beginning of time. It is alluded to in a poem quoted before. Draupnir is not mentioned in the Edda in connection with Frey and Gerda. The Northmen had three grand religious festivals in their year. They all took place in the winter half of the year, between the harvest and seed time. One was celebrated in midwinter about the turn of the day, and from so very nearly coinciding with our Christmas, its name, Yule, came to be applied to the Christian festival. Yule is derived from a name of Odin, but it is said by Lang that this winter feast was held in honour of Thor. In Fouquet's writings, a custom is named which the Scandinavians had of making vows to accomplish some great enterprise before another new year, over a golden boar's head at this winter feast. The mention of the golden boar seems to connect the festival with the god Frey. Probably it was a general propitiation of the summer deities for the coming year. The second festival was in honour of the goddesses, the third, about spring, in honour of Odin, because at this season warlike expeditions began to be undertaken. End of Frey in Myths and Legends Around the World, Collection 13 Read by Sandra, Montreal, 2022The Crystal Palace, read by Medora K. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Crystal Palace Many, many years ago, there lived in the village of Zerndorf a queer little old woman. She was a very kind old lady and a good nurse. Often she was called upon to take care for the boys and girls of the village. They quite enjoyed being ill because she knew so many interesting stories. She told them of great knights and ladies, of castles and fairies, of the wood nymphs and the water sprites. But best of all was the story of old Father Rhine. 
One night, as she sat knitting, a knock came on the cottage door. She opened it, and there stood a strange man carrying a lantern of curious pattern. She did not speak, but he motioned her to follow him. The night was dark, and the rain was pouring down in torrents. Great pools were found in the streets. Aunt Margot, as the children called the old lady, hesitated to follow the stranger, but was not, however, because she was afraid of the storm, but because the man was a stranger. He motioned to her again. She saw that his face was kindly, and so she decided to follow him. Down the dark street they passed, slashing through the deep pools of water. Suddenly, the water became deeper and began to eddy about Margot's ankles. She became frightened and was about to turn and flee. I can't go no further, she shouted. The manner of the man art thou, whither wouldst thou lead me? The old man did not answer, but caught Margot in his arms and plunged into the river Rhine. It had risen from its banks, and as eddying, the waters had frightened Margot. Down, down through the cold green waters they sank. It seemed to Margot as if she were going down forever. She closed her eyes and ceased to struggle. At last they seemed to have passed out of the water, and Margot opened her eyes. She found herself in a wonderful crystal palace. Precious stones glittered all about her. The ornaments were of silver and gold. As soon as she had recovered from her wonder, she was led into an immense chamber. Here on a bed of crystal with silken coverings lay a beautiful golden-haired nymph who was ill. I have brought you here, said the old man, to care for my beautiful wife. Nurse her tenderly back to health, and you shall never regret it. The lovely nymph was so good to look upon that old Margot took great delight in caring for her. She tended her so gently and so faithfully that the golden-haired lady improved rapidly. She was soon quite well. In soft whispers, she told the old nurse that her husband was a mighty water spirit. Mortals called him Father Rhine. She had lived on the earth and was the only daughter of Lord Riedit. One day, when she was at the village dance, there appeared before her a strange man. He was clad in foamy green. He asked her to tread a measure with him. Round and round they whirled until they reached the water edge. Suddenly, he plunged with her into the stream and brought her to the crystal palace, where he made her his happy wife. And now, kind nurse, we must soon part, said the beautiful lady, where Father Rhine offers to reward you, except from him only yours usual fee. No matter how much he urges for you to take more, he loves honesty but loves greed. Just then, Father Rhine appeared. Seeing his beloved wife well again, the river god beckoned to the nurse to follow him. He led her through many halls of the great castle. Finally, they came to his treasure chamber. Here, all around, lay great heaps of gold, silver, and precious stones. The water god was very grateful to the good nurse for saving his wife. So he bade her help herself. The old woman gazed upon the jewels longingly. How well she could use them to help the poor! She remembered, however, what the beautiful golden-haired lady had told her. So she selected only a small fee, such as she always received. The mysterious man urged her to take more, but she firmly refused. Then the great water god took her by the hand and led her through a long, dark cord corridor. Suddenly, she found herself again in the cold water of the Rhine. Slowly, she rose with her through the dark flood, and up they went until she found herself dripping but safe on the shore near her own house. As he beckoned adieu to her, Father Rhine flung a whole handful of gold into her lap, then plunged to, to the river again and was gone. Ever since 
that time, the little people of the village had loved to hear of the wonders of the crystal palace beneath the flood. So the good nurse tells it over and over again, and she never forgets to show the handful of gold, which she says is the same Father Ryan gave to her. End of chapter 12. The Sunken City, read by Medora K. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Sunken City There is once, we are told, a fine tract of land, where now roll the waves of the Zundar Sea. On the very spot where now the fishermen anchor their boats and fish, there stood a beautiful city that was protected from the sea by a great dikes. The name of the city was Stavoren, and the people who lived there were very wealthy. Some of them were so wealthy that they laid their great halls and floors of gold and silver. But in spite of their wealth, they were selfish, thoughtless, and hard-hearted. For the poor people, they cared nothing. The richest person among them was a maiden lady. She had palaces, farms, ships, and counting houses, everything that one could desire. But she thought nothing except how she might increase her store. With this in mind, she one day summoned the captain of her largest vessel. When she came, she bade him to sail away to procure a cargo of the most precious things of earth and to return within the year. Not knowing exactly what she wished, the captain questioned her, but she simply repeated her order and sent him away at once. The captain set sail from Stavoren without knowing where he was going. After leaving the harbor, he called his officers together and asked their advice. Each had a different opinion as to what were the most precious things of earth. The captain was plunged to, into greater trouble than ever. He thought over the question for many hour, long hours, smoked his pipe, and scratching his head. At last, he said to himself that nothing could be more precious than wheat, which is staff of life. Accordingly, he purchased a cargo of grain and returned happily to his native town, arriving long before the year had passed. The haughty lady had, in the meantime, told her friends that her vassal had gone in search of the most precious thing of earth, and she would not tell her closest friend what the most precious thing might be, so everybody was very curious. When one day her captain appeared suddenly before her and told her he had brought the cargo of wheat, her pride vanished. She flew into a terrible rage and commanded that every kernel be cast into the sea at once. The captain was shocked at this order and pleaded with her allow him to give the wheat to the poor. She repeated her command. I will come down to the port myself, she said, to make sure that every kernel is cast into the sea. The captain made his way sadly back to his vessel. As, she did, as he did so, he met several beggars on the way and told them that the cargo of wheat was to be cast into the sea. By the time the lady reached the dock, the poor had gathered there from all parts of the city, hoping to secure some of the grain. When the lady approached, many imploring hands were extended towards her, but all was in vain. Angry and proud, she made the sailors cast all the wheat into the sea. The captain, powerless to prevent the sinful waste, took it on in quite a rage. When the last kernel was disappeared beneath the water, he turned to his haughty mistress. As surely as there is a God above us, he exclaimed, you will be punished for this sin, and the time will come when you, the wealthiest person in Stavoren, will long for a few handfuls of this wasted wheat. The lady listened to his words in haughty silence. When she had finished, she took a costly ring from her delicate hand and cast it into the sea. When this ring comes back to me, she said, I will believe what you say, and fear that I may come to want. 
A few hours after the lady's cook was preparing dinner for her, she was opening a large fish which had just been brought from the sea. When, to his surprise, he fell, up, his eyes fell upon the costly ring. He immediately sent it to his proud mistress. When she recognized it, she turned very pale. Shortly afterward, there came a report that one of her counting houses had been ruined. Another report of disaster came. That evening, all her counting houses were ruined. Her fleet had been destroyed at sea. Her palaces were burning. Her farms were laid waste by storms. In a few hours, everything that she possessed was stripped from her. The palace which she lived in burned down during the night, and she barely escaped with her life. Now she was desolate indeed. The rich people of the city cared nothing for her now that her money was all gone. The poor people for whom she had treated contempt allowed her to die of hunger and cold in a miserable shed. The city of Staverin did not profit by the sad end of the haughty lady. The rich people continued to enjoy life and neglect the poor. It did not matter to them what happened to their wretched fellow creatures. They, like the haughty lady, were truly selfish. As time went on, the sand began to increase in the port. So that it was soon poss- impossible for ships to come to anchor, it grew worse and worse. The waves washed the sand up until a great sandbar rose above the waters, and all further com- commence was stopped. It was not very long before the sandbank was covered with little green blades. The people gazed upon them in surprise. "It is the lady's sand," they declared, "for it is the wheat that she had cast into the sea." That is growing here. The wheat grew very rapidly and bore no fruit. It did not matter to the rich, even if traffic had ceased. They did not suffer. The poor, however, were greatly distressed, for they now had nothing to do. They besought help from the rich, but their prayers fell upon deaf ears. Not long after, a little leak was discovered in the dike, which protected the city. Through this, he. Water crept into the city, reservoir spoiling all the drinking water. The rich people only laughed, saying that they would drink champagne since water had not to be had. But what were the poor to do? They crowded around the gates of the rich, imploring for a sup of beer, but were rudely driven away. It would be a good thing," said the rich, "if these wretched creatures should actually die. Of what use are they to themselves or anyone else? The rich of Staverin had had their last chance to do good. That very same night, when the revelers had returned to sleep, and the sea broke down, and the weakened dikes bursting in covered up the whole town. Over the spot where Staverin once stood, the waves now glittered. In the bright sun light, or plunge and dash when the cold had come sweeping from the sea. Boatmen come rowing from their desolate little fishing town, which now bears the name of the ancient city. When the waters are smoothed, they rest upon their oars and point out beneath them the spires and the turrets and the palaces of Staveron. The streets of the old town, as it lies beneath the waves, once so. Populous are deserted. The market is empty. No sound is to be heard except when some inquiring fish swimming through the belfries strikes one of the bells with its tail. Then there is heard a sad sound which seems to be toiling the knell of the sunken city.